minutes. Um, she's provided minutes for July 22, August 26, and September 23rd. I think September 23rd is easy to deal with since I was the only person here. <laughs> I think I was the only. No, you didn't. We chatted, actually. Excellent. So let the gentleman be observed as part of the event. So I'd like to start with a moving to approve the meeting of September 23rd, since it's a single sentence. Anybody? Mm. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. So, um, in terms of the substantive meetings, <coughs> there was the meeting of July 22nd of 2015. Um, does, do any of the attendees this evening have any recommendations for changes or corrections for that uh, draft? I didn't see any. I have given mine to Edina. Would anybody make a motion to approve those meetings? Make a motion to approve them. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. That's the meeting on the 22nd. And then the 26th, um, another set of um, substantive meetings uh, continuing the uh, Hayden Row matter. Does anybody have any comments about the um, minutes that were presented to us this evening for that? General questions, Chairman? Yes. We have meeting minutes for prior meetings. Well, the ones that come before us and they're written out, we read those and we determine if we think that those minutes correctly reflect the discussions of those nights. I think that we, we review the minutes that are presented to us by the clerk, and those are the minutes that we vote on. Does anybody have any questions as to the minutes of August 26th? Well, they look good to me. Any motion? Move that we accept the meeting minutes of August 26th. Any second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those passed. Thank you. The next item I'd like to take up would be the... Um, the administrative matter, which is Hopkinton Mews. <coughs> it's been brought to our attention that there may have been a Scrivener's error in connection with the written decision for the Hopkinton Mews 40B project, that, it, that the language in the decision for the types of buildings that were going to be constructed does not match the plans that we had approved. Right. Uh, I'm Debbie Horowitz representing Mill Creek. Uh, just as a reminder, when we first uh, applied to this board for our comprehensive permit, we applied for 250 units. And at that point, we had six three-story buildings. As we went through the process and our plans changed and we went to 280, we, went to five, we kept the same number of buildings, but we went to five three-story buildings and made one of them four stories. And uh, at a couple places in the written decision itself, it got the, it got, still kept saying we had six three stories plus a four story. And is it fair to say that the plans that you presented and the plans that we voted on were reflective of the language that you were looking for? Exactly. The final plans that were approved by the board were what we're looking for to get reflected into the decision. There was no confusion on that. Right, exactly. The plans modified as you move forward. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and is there, is there another element of your request for an amendment relating to the change in the number of bedrooms of certain of the units? What, what we, uh, this is the kind of thing that candidly happens all the time as we go from conceptual plans at a permit stage and then to building permit stages, and we probably wouldn't have even come back to this board on, except that we were already coming back for the other okay. administrative change, so we thought we might as well just get it all perfectly done because I can't help myself. Um, so when, uh, in one of the buildings, the four-story building, when uh, the architects were going to actually go to construction level plans, 
the design of some of the two bedroom units had to be switched to one bedroom units. So we've reduced the number of units. We haven't increased the number of units. And so, so yeah. council have, have reduced the number of bedrooms, right? right. Not increased so the, the number of bedrooms. So the unit count is, remains the same. Unit count remains the same, and the bedroom count has gone down by four. Footprints remain the same. Exactly. Height, everything. Everything else. Okay. Thank you. Anything else you want to say? Nice to be back here. Always <laughs> a pleasure to here. see you as well. Nice to see that you're actually moving forward as opposed to putting everybody through all of this and then finding out that you're not going to build a 25-story building in Springfield, but you're only going to build a small building. So. We are actually building, getting ready to start building hopefully later this month. So. See, the Starbucks Good. people will be happy to have you in. <laughs> they have to open first. That's up to Mr. Cadillac. Um, okay, are, are the members of the board aware of the request? Yes. Okay. So what is anybody's pleasure as to the request to amend the decision? And I look at it as potentially, although maybe less than my colleague, um, two elements. One, to change the uh, language of the decision to reflect a um, link between the plans, which we obviously did approve, and the language in the decision. I think it's obviously critically important to make that match. And then the second question, I guess, and if it's separated, is whether or not people feel that it's necessary to do any more than just acknowledge that the bedroom count uh, of some of the units has changed as a result of the, as I understand it, the need to modify the elevator and it takes up more space than had previously been anticipated. So that sounds like it's a code issue. Right. Because the elevator drives Right. Everything. So there's a reduction in the number of bedrooms. Right. As the chairman for the last short while, I made my statement, and now I leave it up to the members. Uh, does that affect in any way the uh, 40B aspect of the, 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 what was approved, the number of bedrooms? No, that's uh, done by unit count. So you get the, the town will still, still get the same numbers of units counted That's on the unit, inventory. Oh, okay. Exactly. That doesn't change. Thank you. So a couple of units will have one less bedroom. Four units will have one less bedroom. Just four? Just four. Out of how many? 280. <laughs> 280 <laughs> units, so only four of those units went changed to be reduced. Seems semi-de minimis to me. It does. Um, I, I, I think I... My view on it is that the, the first issue is, is definitely a Scribner's error. We can, we can correct that under our process. For the, for the other, there's a, there's a process in our 40B procedures that it's called for that I, I believe applicants have complied with um, when during construction changes to the plan are necessary because of something unforeseen. Um, I think we can probably step through that process in about two minutes if we... If we I would recommend that you walk us through it. Um, so I think the uh, applicant has submitted a letter detailing the proposed change. Um, I think it is now to the Zoning Board of Appeals to determine whether uh, we hold a public hearing on that proposed change. We actually are, uh, but not in a, in a sense that this calls for um, re-noticing of butters. So I would, um, I would suggest that we probably find for a de minimis change we don't need to re-notice the abutters and have a, have a public hearing. Um, beyond what we're already doing. Um, and then uh, we can approve this change at a posted meeting. Um, and to do that, we would have to consider whether the proposed change is within the scope of the original plan and public hearing discussions, and if it will potentially impact abutters to the development. And I think we can uh, decide that as well. Um, I have one concern that I'd, I'd just like to vote with town council directly. Um, I, I, the question was already asked and answered by applicants, but do you see any issues with reducing the bedroom count uh, by four, um, four two bedrooms going to four one bedrooms? Uh, I can't think of any issue off the top of my head as long as the um, the number of units that remains affordable remains the same. I think that that should be fine. Fair to say, no change in affordability numbers or anything. No percentage. change in affordability. No change in unit count. And these are we're all. All four of these units, the market rate, the market rate units. Yes. Oh, okay. 
That's a great question, Chris. And um, I'm ready to make a motion unless there's other. Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I interrupt? As a technical matter under the bylaws and following the regulations, probably the first vote, should you choose to go to approve this, would be to vote that the change is, you're calling it de minimis, the language in the regulations is really insubstantial. So maybe the, if you're getting ready to make a motion to um, make a determination that the change is insubstantial and then vote to approve it. Well, I think I, I would view it as um, it is a design change. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a minor design change, but it is a design change, and so that's the, the design change portion was what I was stepping through. So yep. um, it's just that it's a small design change that we don't feel we need to have a, a separate public hearing for. Right. I move to accept that idea that we don't need a separate <laughs> public hearing for that. I'd second that. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Then we've said we don't need a public hearing. Um, then we can approve the ch Well, perhaps we should do it as two separate. But let's. Um, I would move that we correct the uh, Scrivener's error in the original decision regarding the number of buildings, um, as requested by the applicant. I second that. Any discussion? No. no. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved. Aye. Then, Aye. With respect to the design change. Um, I would move that um, we approve the design change um, with a finding that it, the proposed change is within the scope of the original plan and public hearing discussions and will, um, will not potentially impact abutters to the development. Second. Any other discussion? No. Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. I think we're good. Thanks Thank you very time. much. <laughs> nice to see you as always. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, and you. Thank you. You got that. Next item on the agenda I'd like to bring up would be the reorganization of the board. Uh, under our rules, we reorganize every year. And so it's particularly important this year, um, since we need to uh, determine a new chairman of the board. And I would like to recommend, nominate, Mark, uh, as the uh, new chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Second nomination. Um, if, any discussion? No. I just want to say that I think Mark is uh, ideally suited to do this. He's committed. Uh, he has a good base in the procedure and a commitment to the uh, board. And I think he'll be a terrific chairman. I agree. Yeah, Thank you. You're welcome. All in favor of that decision? Aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. You're the new chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. <laughs> and now, from then on, it is your meeting. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I guess the next position to, uh, to deal with would be the vice chairman. And um, I would propose that uh, we, uh, we continue with uh, Mike as the vice chairman. He's ably served in that role and I think would, would continue to. Um, so I would move that we vote, uh, vote Mike as vice chair. I second that. Hope that he continues <laughs> doing a great job. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> All right, Mike. Thanks. You're set. Um, Go ahead. No, anybody else? We need a. Well, technically, I'm still clerk. Um, <laughs> I would, uh, since I'm taking on the chairmanship, I would, I would be happy to not be clerk. But um, we've got a lot in front of us today, so um, perhaps we just defer that till the next time. Yeah. Okay. And see if we can sure. find any other suckers to take on. <laughs> um, and any people that are committed to the town and want to, as you say. <clears throat> um, in that case, I think we are now at um, the continued hearing on 61 Main Street, the appeal of the building permit for that, uh, for that location by Emily Pallott and others. Um, I'm going to take a few moments at the beginning because there's a lot of folks here and I know there's a lot of, um, a lot of interest in this matter. Sure, sure. I, I understand. Um, that uh, you're going to recuse yourself for this one. So thank you for coming.
Um, so um, I, I think what I'll first observe is that um, you know this, uh, this appeal is a legal appeal. Um, it's been brought um, on the grounds that um, the, the proposed the building permit that was granted by the town um, should not have been granted because, uh, in the appellant's view, um, this uh, project qualifies as a health service facility um, as opposed to a uh, retail commercial establishment. Um, as the zoning enforcement officer and director of municipal inspections found. Um, but there are really two legal issues that the board has to address. Uh, perhaps council will tell me there's more than two, but there's two at the, at the outset, I think. Um, the first is standing and the, and the proper appellants, and the second is the merits and whether this truly is a, a health services facility or a retail establishment, um, and thus the building permit was either improper or proper. Um, yeah, as I say, there's been a lot of interest in the town on this, and I, I would um, commend everyone for coming, and um, I, I think we are, are all happy that uh, people in the town are taking interest in this and um, are, are making their voices heard about an important issue within the town. Uh, that said, the, this appeal is focused on legal issues, and so the, um, while we want to hear everyone's views, the, the, uh, when we get to public comment, um, the views of what people would prefer in this location um, or, um, you know, or not um, really don't go to the merits of those legal issues. So um, there's a lot of folks here that I suspect want to speak and we want to make sure that we have time for that. Uh, we do have to end at 10 o'clock and I think uh, we'd all like to try and finish this up if we can um, today. Um, but to allow for that, what, uh, what I think we will have to do is ask people to, um, to try and confine their, their comments to the legal issues that are being raised, um, the issue of the proper appellants and standing, and, um, and then separately the, the merits of, of the issue, and not to uh, preferences or uh, comments about impact of the, of the CVS on the town, uh, because those simply aren't uh, aren't related to the legal issues unless uh, the Newer Council can explain why they are. So with that as, uh, as a setup, um, I think what I would like to do is propose to um, the Appellants Council at first that I'd like to um, try and take those two issues separately just in terms of presentation. I think they have to be separate. We, I, I, would, I would agree that the, the standing and jurisdictional procedural piece come first. Let's get past that one, and then we hopefully can move on to the merits. Now, that said, I think, and I'd, and I'd take town council's view on this, that um, since we would have to close the public hearing to vote on the standing jurisdictional issue, that we'll have to hear all of it um, together. Am I, am I correct on that, or do you feel we could? Um, <clears throat> be my recommendation that you take all evidence that the applicant and the landowner wish to present uh, to the board um, while the public hearing is open, and then hold off on making all decisions until until yeah, you close that, the public hearing and deliberated on met, had an opportunity to deliberate on on both of the issues. And, and I think you that's can, that, can hear a presentation in, in sort of staggered order if that's preferred. Right. But I would uh, I would suspend all decision making. Right. The very end. And council, I, I recognize that um, to an extent, depending on what we would decide on appellants and jurisdictional issue that we might not have to get to the second half of the question. Right. Um, but I, I think it would be prudent for us to do it that way and to hear them to hear them both before we close the hearing and then and then make our decisions. I won't object. Okay. <laughs> um, then with that, you're the appellant, or you're representing um, at least one set of appellants. So right. um, I'll, I'll leave it to you. I appreciate that, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and present uh, to you this evening. My name is Eric Goldberg. I'm with the law firm of Wilson's Cosentino and Friend in Wellesley, and I represent Emily Pilot, Dennis Katz, Jason Mahan, and a number of other folks who have signed on to the uh, application for the appeal of the issuance of the building permit to Hopkinton CP. Uh, Council, just a, let me interrupt you just briefly because I, I realize I forgot something in my in my note. Apologies, given that I uh, just stepped up here. Um, so uh, I, I should note at, at the outset that we have, have had a couple of members recuse. Um, so I, th I think that's known. Um, 
Also, as I had indicated at the last uh, hearing when this was opened, um, I have submitted a conflict form uh, because my wife had made, some, uh, I believe, some comments about the proposed project on one of those social media sites. It's on file with the town clerk, but uh, by our rules, I should disclose that. I don't know if anyone else filled out any of the disclosure forms, but uh, if you did, let's just get that on the record now. No um, need to. Just me. No okay. <laughs> then apologies. Please continue. Um, so to address the procedural piece uh, first, um, the uh, owner uh, has asserted that uh, the appellants here have no standing uh, to appeal the issuance of the building permit because uh, one of the individuals who signed on to the uh, application for appeal, who was an abutter, withdrew uh, his participation in this effort, leaving uh, the remaining folks uh, who signed the application for appeal aren't, who are not abutters. So when we filed, we had some folks who were not direct abutters to the property or abutters to abutters, um, but we had one gentleman who who is an abutter um, within the business, uh, uh, downtown business district. That gentleman withdrew, um, leaving the remaining folks who are not abutters. And as soon as we um, learned, as soon as I learned that um, an, individu an, indi an individual withdrew, uh, we, um, I believe, appropriately amended the application um, by submitting additional signature pages um, for two other folks, Dennis Katz, who, as I'm sure you all know, uh, owns Hopkinton Drug and has operated that business within the downtown business district for many, many years and who is an abutter, as well as Jason Mahan, who lives, uh, and I don't have his address off the top of my head, but his property immediately abuts the parking lot um, uh, of the site. So we added these two folks to our application because they are abutters. Um, the assertion has been made by the owner that the withdrawal of, of uh, Mr. Patel rendered the application jurisdictionally defective because it left uh, no folks any longer who were abutters, who are uh, aggrieved by statute, who you know, could, could support the application. And the owner cites uh, a couple of cases which um, stand for the proposition that a um, an application for relief to a board which is not timely filed is jurisdictionally defective because it cites the, the language under 40A, Section 8, Section 15, um, which says that um, a party aggrieved by a decision of the building commissioner or town authority has 30 days to file an appeal to the zoning board um, to appeal that decision if they're aggrieved by it. And if they don't file the application to the town uh, for relief from the zoning board, then they're time barred. Um, that's if the applicant has knowledge of the issuance of the building permit. You must file within 30 days. There's another prong that the statute allows, which is an enforcement action, as this board is well aware, that because a building permit, is, because no notice is given to abutters from the issuance of a building permit, folks who have no adequate notice of the issuance can, um, at some subsequent time, request enforcement by the billing commissioner, um, and if the decision is denied, then the party is aggrieved by that decision, and they can file within 30 days of the building commissioner's denial of the request for enforcement. So the statute provides two prongs. The case law, and including the cases that were cited by the owner, stand for the proposition that if an individual has adequate notice of a building permit, um, and they do not file within that 30 days following the issuance of the permit, they are time barred, and that person with notice cannot then file uh, or request enforcement and sort of bypass the, the, the initial opportunity to appeal. Those are the cases that the owner has cited to suggest that uh, it was improper for um, our side to amend our application to include Mr. Katz and Mr. Mahone as signatories to the application. Those cases just simply don't apply. <clears throat> They're not relevant. Um, in support of of what I consider to be an appropriate amendment of the application, I cited some cases which stand for the opposite proposition under circumstances that um, mirror what's happened here. And, and that is that even when a case is filed in court, an appeal of a, of a zoning board's decision is, is, is then appealed to the, to the court, 
there's still a standing problem, uh, a standing issue. Um, only those with standing, only those aggrieved, aggrieved people with standing can bring a, an appeal to court. So what's happened in the court sometimes is that the filing itself is defective because, as it turns out, a plaintiff who brings the action may lack standing. And the way that's been treated in the courts is that when a, when a plaintiff is found to lack standing, the complaint has been amended. The courts have allowed the complaint to be amended to add a brand new plaintiff who does have standing to cure what would have been determined to be a jurisdictional defect. The issue, though, is timing. What ha what's happened in the cases that I cite is that the action was timely filed to the court by folks who believed that they could bring the action forward, only later to be determined by the court that the plaintiffs lacked standing. But because the action was timely filed, the court allowed an amendment to bring in a new plaintiff, an entirely new plaintiff, who was not a party to the case at the initial filing. And the addition of the new plaintiff, who was then determined to have standing, was effectively related back to the, the time of the filing. That's what's going on here, if, if, if at all. So what we have is a timely filed application for the appeal of the building permit to Hopkinton CP um, LLP. The application that we filed was submitted to the town with signatures of all appropriate folks, including an abutter, within the 30 days following the issuance of the building permit. The fact that Mr. Patel withdrew his participation does not render the filing of the application untimely. It, is, it was timely filed. We met the 30-day requirement. It, just as in the cases that we cite, the action filed in court was timely filed, but a, a, an alleged defect due to standing was cured by adding somebody new. That's what we've done. We've followed that, that jurisprudence in those sort of cases. Timely filed, we met the 30-day deadline, we filed it, including with an abutter. We didn't have to if you follow those cases. But we brought on two more folks who are abutters. So my, my, my um, argument is that we, we're here properly. The folks who are bringing this appeal are here properly because we filed it on time. We met the jurisdictional requirement under the statute. And if there was a defect, by virtue of Mr. Patel withdrawing his participation after filing, we've cured that by adding Mr. Katz and Mr. Mahan as signatories to the application. The, the other sort of nuance that the owner suggests is that Mr. Katz signed it um, individually, but the address is 52 Main Street. He doesn't live there. His business is there. And I mean, he, everybody knows. I mean, if he, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's, um, it's, it's not a um, significant concern in my mind that he may have signed it individually as opposed to on behalf of the entity that has been sitting in that property for years and years. But it doesn't really matter because even if that's a problem, we have Mr. Mahan and he is a direct abutter. So we've, we've cured whatever problem the owners uh, have suggested uh, arose from the withdrawal of Mr. Patel. Um, again, very simply, the cases they cite stand for the proposition that a a, an action or an application for appeal to this board that is not timely filed is defective. Ours was timely filed. That's really the end of the story um, on that piece. Um, uh, Council, if, if, if you have more on your presentation and your clients to speak to this, I, it's, I understand a legal issue, so perhaps not. But uh. um, Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I don't know if anybody wants to get up and respond to that, but um, uh, do you, does it make sense for the board to hear the owner's rebuttal well, we, to that we, we now? Will. We or? Will. I, I think yeah. what I would propose is we, uh, is yes. our normal procedure. I'll ask the board if they have any questions of you on, on your presentation. Sure. And continue on. Yeah. Yes, sir. A question. When you mentioned Mr. Katz, um, so is it fair to say that he is a principal in the owner of that property? Uh, to the best of my understanding, but he, he, even if he's not, I, I believe the, 
I believe, and I don't have a site off the top of my head, but you don't have to be an owner. You can be a tenant. You can be a lessee. You can be a longtime tenant of a property and have standing if you are on a property that abuts, you know, something going on. Um, I'm not sure it really makes a difference. I, Mr. Katz can answer that question for himself. He's here. Um, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is he's been in the, the, his business has been in the downtown business district for decades. And to suggest that he doesn't have standing by virtue of the fact that he signed, you know, individually as opposed to on behalf of the business is silly in my mind. But it doesn't matter because we have Mr. Mahan, who is, who is a direct butter. So if there's an issue with the way Mr. Katz signed it, it's, it's, it's immaterial. I'm not suggesting whether it's silly or not silly. It was simply a question as to whether or not he is a principal and the owner of the property. I can't imagine he is, and I can't imagine he wouldn't know. Um, Mr. Katz tells me that he's the trustee of Katz Realty Trust. Hopkins and Drug is a tenant of Katz Realty Trust, um, and he's and so he's he is a he is a principal of the entity that owns the property, which then leases it to. That's all I was asking. Thank you. No questions. No. 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 Thank you. Right um, I, I have uh, one additional, I, I guess. Um, would, it, would you argue, or are you arguing, I suppose, um, that neither of the two uh, additional appellants um, is making the case that they did not have notice? Um, thank you for asking that question. It's a good one. Um, Mr. Mahan did not, as it happens, did not have notice of the issuance of the building permit, Just despite um, the, the group that I represent, despite their rabid, rabid effort to um, make sure that everybody with an interest in this understood what was going on. As it turns out, um, he actually didn't, ha he tells me, didn't have notice of the issuance of the building permit, although, you know, he, we, he was contacted and was willing to um, become a participant in the matter that's been filed. To address that very issue, um, Mr. Mahan did request enforcement, um, submit a written request for enforcement to the town uh, on September 4th, I think, and by letter dated September, let's see. So Mr. Mahan did submit a request in writing dated September 4th. Uh, to address to uh, Michael Shepard, Charles Cadlick, and Elaine Lazarus seeking enforcement, essentially enforcement of the very, you know, bylaw that we're here challenging. Um, and um, Mr. Shepard responded in writing, as he's required to do, on September 25th, 2015, denying the request for enforcement, which um, was anticipated. And so, um, because he didn't have notice of the issuance of the permit and because he properly was permitted to request enforcement, um, he's complied with the statutory requirements. So as a practical matter, um, if for some reason the withdrawal of Mr. Patel from the participation of the original filing renders it defective, which I suggest it doesn't, we're going to be right back here, um, arguing the very same merits of the very same issue as we are today. Um, so um, to answer your question. And unfortunately, he's not, Mr. Mahan is not here. He's been traveling for a number of months with his family. But um. Um, As he's not here, um, perhaps can you, uh, do you know when he first was notice, notified? Of the issuance of the permit? Of the issuance of the permit. He didn't learn about the issuance of the permit until more than 30 days after it was, until after the, the present filing was submitted. Um, I don't know the exact date, but I assure you it was more than 30 days after um, it was filed. It was issued. Okay. Thank you, Council. Sure. No one has anything further than. No, nothing for me. Okay. Then, um, in an appeal, uh, uh, our next uh, our next move would be to uh, to Mike Shepard, since it's his decision under appeal. Um, Mike, do you have any anything you want to <coughs> speak on? Or uh, obviously, the owner's here, so. Yeah. All right. Then uh, I believe we have counsel for the owner. Here as well, and uh, let's, let's hear their presentation.
Good evening. My name is Ben Time, and I'm co-counsel for Crosspoint Associates, Inc., the owner of 61 Main Street. Uh, with me is uh, co-counsel Marissa Pizzi from Bowditch and Dewey. Um, I'm going to be speaking to the standing issue this evening, and uh, Attorney Pizzi will be speaking to the substantive uh, zoning questions. We um, have copies of all of the cases that we uh, have cited in our various memoranda to the board on both issues. And with uh, the new chairman's permission, uh, we'd like to circulate those. So not to add to your paperwork, but if there is a particular case that you want to look at. <laughs> I, I do know that the clerk asked counsel for copies of their cases if they, if, or to have them available. So. <laughs> So as to the sequencing of um, the arguments and the board's intention to address both arguments, that, that is certainly our preference. Uh, we believe that we'll you know, be giving you uh, the law and the arguments this evening that demonstrate why we should prevail on both issues. And certainly if we you know, had our preference as to the final decision, we would say that the appellants lose on standing. Um, which is a very critical jurisdictional issue, of course, and deserves the treatment that you're giving it. But even if they did have standing, they would lose on the substantive zoning questions. So those, um, we're, we're happy to be able to present uh, both. <clears throat> so Attorney Goldberg, with respect, has overcomplicated the initial question of the attempt to amend the appeal by adding uh, Mr. Katz and Mr. Mahan. I'm going to explain in a minute why the particular um, state process of a judge being permitted to amend a pleading to add a party is the, juris is the jurisprudence that is actually completely inapplicable to the situation. And so I'll get to that, but Mr. Uh, Goldberg quite accurately explained our position with respect to uh, the way the law treats untimely appeals under sections 8 and 15 of chapter 40A, he just got the conclusion wrong um, because as he points out, the case law is very clear and we cite this in the Connors v. Anino case, uh, SJC from 2011, <clears throat> that says that um, there is a 30-day appeal period of the issuance of a building permit under sections 8 and 15 of chapter 40A. And that um, appeal period is, a, is enforced quite rigidly, um, unlike other aspects of the law, which we'll, which we'll get to. And what that case says quite clearly is that if a party has not just actual notice, but actual or constructive notice, in other words, that the person knew or should have known about the particular project and issuance of a permit, then the party's on notice and is subject to the to the 30-day requirement. Now, we've certainly heard nothing here tonight um, from Mr. Mahan. Mr. Mahan's not here to give testimony as to whether he had actual notice and if he didn't, when he obtained it, or whether he had constructive notice. And anyone who has been following this matter certainly knows that um, there has been a lot of public comment press coverage, um, and other uh, communications well known within the town of Hopkinton going back to May or June uh, about uh, CVS uh, being the tenant at this property and Crosspoint receiving the building permit. Now the deadline for appealing the building permit was uh, July 27th. And <coughs> This isn't a question, as Attorney Goldberg suggests, of whether it's a timely filed appeal. There was a timely filed appeal. The problem is it was a timely filed appeal by five individuals, only one of whom had presumptive standing as an abutter, and he withdrew in writing. So it's a timely filed appeal of four people who don't have presumptive standing, don't have standing at all, and I'll talk a little bit about standing, but I would respectfully submit that Attorney Goldberg has at least implicitly conceded that without the addition of these two new individuals, he doesn't have standing. He um, says in his letter, for example, um, that by adding these parties, the two new parties, in an attempt to replace Mr. Patel, in Mr. Goldberg's words, accordingly, 
the board continues to have jurisdiction to hear and decide the appeal. So he clearly attempted to add these parties because he recognized that it was a appeal that uh, did not have appellants withstanding, and we can talk more about that. But I think that that is fairly plain based on the actual manner in which um, the appellants have attempted to salvage their, their um, <coughs> appeal in this way. Now, um, what the Connors case also says, and this is quite relevant to what Mr. Mahan apparently did, uh, in that particular case there were two individuals who failed to timely file an appeal of a building permit that was issued. They decided then instead to do um, what the case calls a procedural bypass, which is to then file a request for zoning enforcement to the building inspector under Section 7 of 40A. Um, the court correctly said, no, that's an end run around this very rigidly enforced 30-day requirement to um, appeal via Sections 8 and 15 um, the issuance of a building permit. So the court said if we allow that kind of a procedural end run, it makes the rule of the of 30 days, uh, the 30-day appeal period superfluous, and they wouldn't allow that to happen. So we're in the same exact situation here. Again, there's no evidence that Mr. Mahan didn't have actual or constructive notice by the July 27th deadline. And when Mr. Katz, who certainly knew plenty about this situation, and Mr. Mahan, uh, about whom we have no actual evidence concerning his uh, constructive knowledge or actual knowledge, when they missed that deadline, they missed their opportunity to appeal. They have now tried to make a procedural end run through this uh, attempt at an amendment. So it's really as simple as that. It has nothing to do with whether the thing was t timely filed at the beginning, um, whether Mr. Patel, you know, was part of it at the beginning. He's withdrawn, so the abutter is, is out. And so are Mr. Mahan and Mr. Katz, I would respectfully um, submit to the board. I would like to give the board a copy of the section of the general laws which deals with the type of amendment. <coughs> Passing those over. Thank you. So this is um, this is Chapter 231, Section 51 of the Mass General Laws. It's this section of the statute that entrusts in a superior court judge the equitable authority to amend a complaint. It's that authority that permits judges in the context of a Chapter 40A-17 appeal to Superior or Land Court to add parties. And so the cases that Mr. That Attorney Goldberg uh, has cited are correct that, yes, there are instances where an appeal is filed under Chapter 17, which, as you know, would be an appeal of this board's action, quite different from Section 15, where the case law is quite clear, as I've mentioned, as to how rigidly applied the 30-day rule is. But under 17, yes, a judge can say, I'm going to let in a new party who's in a butter. And sometimes that does rescue a case that is jurisdictionally deficient for lack of standing. The reason that can be done is because it's a state court judge who is given the equitable authority to do that under this statute. Um, and under the rules of uh, civil procedure in Massachusetts, Rule 15, which permits, again, judges to amend complaints to add parties. That is a part of the law that has absolutely nothing to do with the issue before you with respect to zoning boards of appeal. There's nothing in the law that gives you that authority. That's authority, uh, equitable authority that's given to a state court judge, not to any to zoning boards of appeal, and therefore it's sections 8 and 15 of 40A that govern uh, this process. And there's absolutely nothing in the law that would permit um, these two parties to be added to the complaint, to the appeal, rather. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions about that aspect of the argument. But I think once we get past the amendment issue, uh, again, it's clear that zoning boards of appeals, just like courts, uh, do, as you're doing, need to treat the jurisdictional question of standing seriously. Um, the way the law works, as you know, is that if you are not a person aggrieved 
under section uh, sections 8 and 15 <coughs> of the statute you do not have legal standing to uh, bring an appeal another way the courts say that is that the, the the court or the board receiving the appeal doesn't have jurisdiction to even hear it if the person isn't a person aggrieved and as you also know very well um, abutters and abutters two abutters within 300 feet have presumptive standing others do not and in order for someone who doesn't fall within those categories of presumptive standing they have to show that their concerns are special or different from those of the community that they have an individualized particularized harm to themselves or their property which of course abutters often can claim at least on a prima facie basis now none of these four remaining appellants live with even within even two miles of the site and so they it's impossible for them to allege any particular concern that is special or different um, from the concerns of the rest of the community there's no injury to any of these four remaining appellants they live far away from the site they're not harmed in any way in a particularized fashion as as owners of, of property nor have they even tried to allege such individualized harm so for those reasons we believe the case on standing is very strong a that the appeal should not be amended to add mr. Katz and mr. Mahan and failing to add them if the board does agree that that's correct and we hope that you will it's also equally clear that this group does not have standing to appear so happy to answer any questions I was remiss at the beginning to not also mention that um, mr. Huber is here and is happy to answer questions that the board has with respect to probably more likely the zoning issues than the standing issues um, but in any event uh, we're happy to answer any of those questions I'll answer them now on standing and then my co-counsel Ms. Pizzi will be ready pr to present after attorney Goldberg on the questions of uh, retail use and why mr. Shepard was correct in issuing the building permit council and it, just for the record if you could remind uh, everyone who mr. Huber is uh, yes so John Huber who's the president of cross point associates uh, he's here with his team um, and again happy to you know to answer questions and of course uh, attorney Pizzi and I are as well so thank you then I will defer for questions first to my vice chairman thank you <coughs> the new vice chair <laughs> same as the old vice chairman of uh, council in, in the various cases that you provided, um, did any of these cases deal with a situation similar to this where the appeal was filed by at least a, what I will call a statutorily aggrieved abutter, um, and then um, others were let in as compared to a case where everybody who filed was this is bad grammar was not a statutorily aggrieved abutter and then somebody sought to add such a person after the case was filed the answer is no um, we did not find a case that was you know included this particular and somewhat peculiar set of facts but I would submit that the that the um, SJC case um, that we cite uh, is quite similar in that there was this attempt to do an end run around the 30-day appeal and that's really what we believe this was as well and actually now we're, we're, we're learning that there were two attempts at an end run in a sense that mr. Mahan has also filed a um, request for zoning enforcement that was denied and presumably may seek to pursue an appeal of that in front of the ZBA and the um, the SJC case uh, Menino uh, is quite I mean that that's that's that that is that case that that's not permitted but the more critical <coughs> holding of that case is that if someone has actual or constructive notice of a building permit there's one way that they can participate in an appeal and that's by being an original uh, appellant as the group of five was but this additional group of two is not and again the one of butter that was part of the group of five has written it submitted something in writing saying that he's no longer part of the appeal May I ask a couple more questions and to, to staff um, for the record it's my understanding that mr. is it mr. Patel mr. Patel's withdrawal occurred 
after the 30-day appeal period that would have been applicable to allow for the appeal to be brought to us. Is that correct, Adina, to your knowledge? Yes, to my knowledge. All right, so, so the appeal was filed with a, what I call a statutory abutter, and after the 30 days appeal, 30-day period expired, the statutory abutter withdrew. So this was not a case where somebody withdrew when there was time to substitute somebody who was a statutory abutter. Okay. And in the materials that we have, because um, often I think, I apologize if I haven't looked carefully enough, in the normal case you often um, supply a uh, printout or something of the statutory abutters, abutters to abutters within 300 feet. Did you file something like that with us, or do you not do that when it's an appeal? Um, I do not with that. I don't think in the, if, if there's anything that would be in the back of this folder, it would be hard. Mm -hmm. You guys probably do not have a different folder. Oh, in here. Yeah, maybe in the back. Maybe everything in the I thought I had seen one at one point, but uh, okay. while, and, you, while you continue on, I'll Okay, and so, but it is your argument, counsel, that both of the purported, what I'm calling generically small s, statutorily aggrieved abutters, um, it's your position or your assertion that they were both aware within the 30, original 30-day 30 appeal period that the building permit was uh, granted? Well, I, I, I believe that it's Attorney Goldberg's burden to demonstrate that they did not have actual or constructive knowledge. I, I, I mean, Mr. Katz is here, so he can answer that question. I would be flabbergasted if he didn't have uh, actual or constructive notice of the building permit. And Mr. Mahan is not here to answer that question. Um, and so I certainly would um, I urge the board not to uh, simply take uh, a hearsay representation from, uh, uh, well, Council has said that he did not know. It doesn't go to the, at all to the other side of the equation of did he have constructive knowledge? I and I think we all, I mean, you live in the town, I, I don't, but having followed this uh, as council on the matter, uh, I do know that uh, the town was abuzz with uh, social media and other chatter and activity relating to this going back to May. So, a couple of questions one may be for you, and one may be for our staff. Um, is there anybody here on behalf of your client who was involved in the actual uh, application uh, for the permit or the build out of the uh, property pursuant to that permit? Well, I mean, Mr. Huber was and his team were involved in the submission of the building per permit application. Is that the question? Well, I mean, what I'm trying to get at, and maybe I'll ask also for, for our side over here in terms of um, uh, Chuck or Mike, uh, once, is it fair to say that once a building permit is issued, the request and actually the requirement is that the permit be posted in some obvious uh, place on the property that has been granted the permit? Is that correct? And I, I'm just, this is why I asked the, the council, do you, do either of you have any actual knowledge as to whether in any time soon or simultaneous with the issuance of the building permit that that permit was or was not posted uh, on the property? Okay. Okay. So the same thing, Council, I'm curious as to is there anybody who on behalf of your client um, who was working on pursuing the building permit and having it issued, who could it give us any indication one way or the other, if as is the requirement, um, that that permit was posted in a conspicuous place on the property close to or simultaneous with its issuance? Um, let me confer with my clients on that particular question. Um, and I have one other thing to add as well. <clears throat> so we believe the answer is yes, but we um, are checking um, that. I will say um, that the issuance of the building permit was something that was published in the Hop News, 
I'm told, and we certainly can um, find that, that article. Um, I would also say with respect to the standards that typically govern the question of constructive notice that, um, you know, a direct abutter, which Mr. Mahan is, he lives on Grove Street, I believe, um, is essentially, um, in most cases, deemed to be on notice of, of things that are occurring next door. Now, um, again, he's not here to, to tell us what he knew, but uh, I would submit that um, his, um, the standard by which we should judge him on constructive notice uh, as an abutter is different than someone like um, one of the other uh, appellants who lives two, three miles away. A last question for me. Um, you mentioned language in one of the cases, um, both as a result of the statute and the language in the cases, of courts being able to exercise some degree of equitable authority to make a determination if people would be appropriately added as parties. Are you suggesting that under the cases and all that the Zoning Board of Appeals would not have any similar equitable authority? Well, I, I am suggesting that. I mean, I know of no statutory or case law or other authority that respectfully entrusts that level of discretion in any uh, municipal board on matters of standing. Um, 40A is rigidly applied in all kinds of contexts, uh, including appeal deadlines. I mean, I think where a lot of us uh, who do this kind of work are familiar with how harsh some of those cases can be when someone misses a deadline uh, to file under oh, Section 17. Well aware. Um, or some of these other sections. And so uh, with respect to many areas of municipal law, but particularly Chapter 40A, which is the statute I know best in terms of municipal law, um, there is no such discretion that I'm, that I'm aware of, and certainly there's no case that Mr. G uh, Attorney Goldberg was able to cite. Surely Attorney Goldberg would have brought such a case to your attention. Instead, he had to rely on only um, state court cases where a judge did that, and um, I think it's clear that that is pursuant to an entirely different statutory scheme and something that judges are, you know, given under state law, which is that type of equitable authority. Although, as you know, not, not even all judges have that. So um, it really is, I think, quite clear that there is, there is no mechanism um, to do what Attorney Goldberg has asked to do with respect to adding these uh, untimely uh, appellants. Thank you. I have nothing of X, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Tom? I have, I have one question for our staff. When we're issuing, or when you're issuing a building permit, is there any notice, written notice, as there is when they, someone appeals, applies for a variance or a special permit? to the abutters, or it's just a simple, so it would be up to the abutter or someone to observe. figure it out. Thank you. That's all. No. Actually, I had a similar question. So you don't, um, letters don't have to be sent out, but is there any kind of, um, I guess, public notice that would have to be put in there? So nothing at all. So it's, it's, in the office, every permit issue, you know, so it's up to, it'll be up to them to just to, to pursue well, One follow-up. So, okay. Mr. Chairman, one follow-up. Is it or is it not a requirement that upon the issuance of a building permit that it be posted on the property? Thanks. Okay, thanks. It's not just somebody's choice. It's, it's what you're supposed to do. Okay, thanks. It's time. Don't go, don't go anywhere. Okay. <laughs> um, is it your position? Uh, well, let me ask you. Uh, what is your position on whether um, there was presumptive standing at the time the appeal was filed? Whether there was presumptive standing. Well, at the time that the appeal was filed, um, there was an abutter who um, had presumptive standing. Now, if that abutter were still in the case, then the burden would then be on us to challenge that presumption. Uh, which we, you know, obviously did not need to do because he withdrew. Um, but that is how the mechanism works. And so once the presumption is uh, adequately challenged, the, uh, that recedes, and then you get into a contest of, again, is there individualized harm? Um, it's completely hypothetical as to 
whether or not Mr. Patel would have had the type of harm that is cognizable by state law, um, usually commercial interests, competitive interests, if that was something that was running through his mind at the time or not sufficient bases for standing. But again, that's um, an unnecessary um, debate to have because he withdrew. I would just say on the posting issue, um, and again, we'll get you the facts of that, but certainly that, that does not go to the question of whether, uh, well, let me put it this way. If, the, if it was posted, then that's one more reason why Mr. Mahan, you know, should have known. But if it was not posted, that is not dispositive of the question of whether he had constructive notice because the cases, you know, cite all kinds of reasons why someone should have known, one of which is you live next door to the place. No. Um, I guess to and um, Mr. Huber, uh, actually, Mr. Huber, could you come to the microphone? Just we're going to have this as testimony directly, but we do have news on the building permit. Yes, we um, we would always post a building permit on site where it was inspectional services would come in and take a look at the at the building. They'd have to have some idea a permit number and things like that to be sure of what was going on. So we would post demo permits, building permits, and any other safety permits uh, on site. So it, it's your testimony then that the building permit was posted here? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council, uh, kind of going on, I mean, you're not contesting, are you, that as filed initially, um, that the appeal was filed timely? The appeal was filed timely, yes. Okay. Um, so in your presentation earlier, you, you did point out that um, non-abutters can have standing to appeal um, if their harm is particular. Um, and and I, I take that um, from the cases as well. Um, what's your position on at what point it is determined whether an abutter or a non-abutter has standing? Because an, an right. abutter can, who is presumptively has standing right. can be found to not and, and vice versa. Right. So the key word there is, is non-abutters can theoretically have standing. I'm not aware of any case where they've actually been determined to have standing when they live as far away as, as these appellants do. But the way the law works, it's very similar to the discussion that we had a minute ago about um, presumptions that recede and then um, there's a contest on the evidence. So the way it works is that the four remaining appellants do not have a presumption of standing. So the burden uh, never, the, the burden never left them to have to demonstrate that. In other words, um, Mr. Patel, as a uh, if he were still part of this, did have a presumption. The burden would then have been on us to put forward evidence to say, no, no, you don't have enough particularized harm. And, and then there's a contest on the merits. This group of four appellants have the burden to prove to this board that the impacts that they allege will occur from um, the carrying out of this building permit will, uh, the, the, the language of the case law is, uh, cause a definite violation of a private property interest, of a private legal interest, or of a private right. And the cases talk about particularized harm, harm that is special or different than uh, generalized concerns of the community. And I don't think there's really any debate that the types of um, concerns that these appellants have raised go to community-based concerns. They have nothing, in other words, None of these appellants could come forward and say, this is going to impact um, you know, my commute out of my home or, or anything that is particularized to them. So the burden's on them to do that, and certainly there's been nothing presented, and I think it would be impossible for any of these particular appellants to show particularized harm and therefore standing. And you know, the, ca there, there's, there, the cases routinely kick these kinds of appeals out uh, when you have people who are not uh, abutters or abutters to abutters with presumptive standing. And, and I understand your position, but at the point at which it would be determined whether they have standing or not would be when we make our decision. Uh, right. You know, you have, right. You have to decide whether they have met that burden. Right. Right. Okay. Um, sure. Um, had you given the council any thought to if you were put in the position, I'm not suggesting you are or you are not, 
uh, of raising the question as to whether the two arguably statutorily agreed abutters should the board make the determination ultimately that they are timely filed? Have you given any thought to any presentation you would make to then rebut that presumptive abuse status? Um, I can't say we've given it much thought because we thought that the law was, was so clear that they are, you know, to have them part of the appeal is, is illegitimate and that it was a, uh, a clever maneuver by Attorney Goldberg, but one that the law does not permit. Um, if the board were to decide to nonetheless add them, um, then we, you know, we would certainly uh, want the opportunity to discuss their their potential lack of standing. But I think, uh, to us, the issue is quite clear on the amendment issue. Uh, and as I said at the very beginning, you know, we're very happy and looking forward to this evening uh, presenting the zoning case. And our hope is that as the board will say, sure. uh, will say, yeah, you've probably heard plenty about standing by now. Um, but our hope certainly is that the board will conclude that this group does not have standing, but then we'll go on to the next issue in the alternative and say, even if they did, I was just curious if you'd analyze that. Thanks. I understood. And, and to that point, though, I mean, this is the point during our hearing where if you have anything you'd like to offer on those two, should we decide to admit them in, this is the, your point to right. rebut that. Right. So. Well, I mean, contrary to what Attorney Goldberg suggested in his argument, we, we are not in any way hanging our hat on, on this issue of uh, Mr. Katz being the abutter and, and, not, and not hopping to drug. We mention it simply because Attorney Goldberg made the representation to the board that Mr. Katz is an abutter, and just as a factual matter, he, he is not the abutter. Um, the uh, entity of which he is a trustee once or twice removed, I forget the exact actual configuration, is the abutter. So, so Mr. Katz, I mean, it's, he's not the abutter. Um, his company is. Mr. Mahan, um, appears to be an abutter. Again, we feel strongly that they shouldn't, they, that they shouldn't be added. And as to um, Mr. Katz's interests, those would clearly appear to be driven by an interest in uh, preventing competition, which is not a cognizable basis well, and, for standing. And we'll, we'll get to that, too. Uh, but uh, I guess to that point, if, if you're not resting your, your, your case on that, certainly, um, it, you know, if uh, Mr. Katz were to clarify that he was um, he was signing on behalf as a trustee of his realty trust, um, which is the uh, the abutting entity. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just I think that 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 discussion, you know, respectfully, is not really even worth having because again, that would be a, a sort of a further attempt to amend the amendment and the original. Attempted amendment is is invalid. So I think I think we've, you know, certainly provided the, the the case law on that point and why we think that the board should should absolutely not permit um, Mr. Katz, Hopkinton Drug, or Mr. Mahan uh, to be added as appellants. Two questions, Adina. In you know where this is going. In any of these filings, is there a map? Uh, there is the abutters list and the labels. I don't know if there's a map. Um, there's probably a, yeah, here it is. I just wanted to refresh. This is a two-part question. I wanted to refresh my recollection as to the specific location of Mr. Mahan. The address is Jason Mahan. So he's 20 Grove Street. And would it be obvious, Adina or Elaine, where that is in connection on this map? Sir, sure. for everybody's edification, Mr. McMahon, McMahon lives right next door to the hot dog stand. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. That's very helpful. And, and the last thing, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, is would you suggest, Council, that that were you pressed to make a presentation, uh, at least to the extent that it makes any difference relative to <coughs> the trustee that owns the Hopkinton drug site, that that would be 
your position would be something like a YD dugout matter in terms of its being a commercial as against commercial uh, competition issue as opposed to some specific uh, particularized impact in terms of the use of the property. That's correct. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, it would appear to be um, pursuing uh, an interest that the zoning bylaws are not designed to protect, namely lack of business competition. Thanks. Nothing else. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I have one final. Uh, hopefully this is the last, unless anybody has come up with another. Um, I, I think you had represented that, um, um, that the statute that speaks to courts amending, amending pleadings uh, gives the courts that power. Um, and, and you suggested that this board wouldn't have power, but uh, is it your, your position that this board um, would only have an equitable power if it was granted specifically by statute? Because that's not my traditional understanding of equitable powers. Um, that, that actually is my understanding. I mean, I think that, you know, you have district court judges and um, housing court judges who do not have the same equitable authority as superior court judges who are granted that authority um, you know, specifically by statute. So I think that the role of, of boards of appeals and planning boards are quite tightly prescribed by Chapter 40A, and there's nothing in Chapter 40A, which certainly I think we could all agree is the, the governing statute for what this board works hard to do, um, includes any mechanism whatsoever along the lines of what Attorney Goldberg is trying to utilize. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Just one last? No? No? Okay. Um, Attorney Goldberg, I see that you have something you'd like to add. Yeah, add I, I, I would like to respond to some of the um, statements that were made briefly. I don't want to belabor this any more than it really needs to be. Um, I, I think a lot of assumptions are being made quite unfairly, uh, frankly. Um, there are assumptions or presumptions being made about what this is about. This isn't about business competition, as far as I'm concerned. And that's not what my presentation is going to be. This is about the integrity of the downtown business district, plain and simple. This is about the interpretation of a bylaw in a district which defines what the uses in that district are supposed to be or not be by right, by special permit. They want to make this about business competition. That's just simply wrong. This isn't about business competition. We take a respectfully different uh, view or interpretation of what this town's bylaw requires or permits in the downtown business district. We disagree with the owner about what the bylaw says. We have every right to disagree. And we, the folks who are here, um, on whose behalf I'm talking, have every right to exercise their rights under the bylaw to present to this board a difference of opinion in the interpretation of the bylaw, to protect the integrity of town meeting and the integrity of, of, of what the town, in its wisdom, has decided should or shouldn't go in the downtown business district. The owners suggest in news articles that we have no right to be here. We have every right to be here. That's what this board's function is, by statute, to resolve these sorts of differences in interpretation. So there are assumptions being made, I think, quite unfairly to mischaracterize what this is all about. Council, so, uh, just, just to, to that point, I think I, I don't, if I understood the presentation, it was specifically with respect to Mr. Katz and, and the particularized harm to him and whether that would qualify him as, uh, as harmed, even though in his trustee capacity he'd be in a butter. Um, so I, I don't view that as going to the merits of whether, whether the appellants have the right to be here in general. So I, I take your point. But okay. But I just I want to be clear. Um, th there are, there's a presumption being made about what Mr. Mahan does or doesn't know. I, I obviously can't speak for him uh, as well as he could speak for himself. Um, but I can say, um, having discussed this matter with him, that as he informed me, he did not have no did not have notice of the issuance of the building permit, notwithstanding the fact that he lives next door to the property. If this board were to take a view, you would see that there are a line of trees and shrubs separating his property from the parking lot. I don't know where they posted the, the, the permit on their building. What I do know from speaking with Mr. Mahan is that he actually wasn't aware. So we're not, we're not, he's not making an end run around 
the 30-day limitation established by the cases that the owner cites, he is simply exercising his independent right to have requested enforcement, and he will take whatever measures he thinks are necessary to appeal the decision if we have to go there. The, the, the fact of the matter is, I, I, I disagree that um, he needs to stand here tonight or needed to stand here tonight to suggest to say whether he does or he doesn't because if we file an, if he files an appeal of the building commissioner's re denial of enforcement he will be standing here and he will tell this board that he had no notice and so we're right back where we started from so I think the the assumption or the presumption that the owner wishes to, to make and characterize about what Mr. Mahan does or doesn't know is also unfair. I think the other thing that's unfair from a procedural standpoint is the fact that the owner wants to fundamentally penalize the folks that are in this room and deprive them of an opportunity to have their voices heard and deprive them of an opportunity to have this board interpret the bylaw by virtue of the fact that a, an admittedly an admitted statutory presumptive abutter who participated in the filing, who they agree was timely filed, who they agree was a presumptive abutter, withdrew after the 30 days had expired, after the matter had been filed with this town, and, thought, and after the 30-day the timeline to bring an appeal by anybody. So they want to penalize all the folks in this room and those who have an interest in this matter because one person for reasons which we don't know, withdrew his participation in this matter at a strategically disadvantaged um, time frame. That is manifestly and fundamentally unfair. And the folks that are here, Mr. Katz, who isn't a butter, Mr. Mahan, who isn't a butter, they ought not to be penalized by Mr. Patel's decision to withdraw at the time that he did. Um, so I want to make that point. They have no cases to suggest that the amendment, however you want to characterize it, was incorrect. Now, candidly, I don't have a case that says it is correct. But what I do have and what I've provided this board are cases that mirror, mirror the scenario that's going on here. Timely filed, an assertion that there's a lack of standing, and in, in, an, in an exercise of belt and suspenders to bring somebody else in who we know to be uh, a statutory butter. Um, Mr. Mahan didn't know. We don't have an issue of the 30-day deadline. Whether Mr. Katz did or di didn't, I would suggest is immaterial because what the courts have said is that when this scenario happens in the court setting, the amendment of the complaint, the, the involvement of a brand new plaintiff is related back to the time of filing. Let's not forget 40A17 17 says, uh, I think it's 17, that if you fail to bring an appeal within 20 days, if you fail to bring it, to file it in court within the 20 days, you are forever time barred. It's like a statute of repose. If you don't hit that 20-day deadline, you're done. But in the cases that I cite, the situation that arose was that a brand new plaintiff had come in and had been allowed to be added to a case. And the courts recognized it was long after the newly added plaintiff ever would have had an opportunity to be a participant in a zoning appeal because it was after the 20-day deadline that's dictated by statute, which I agree with counsel, it's, it's, it's strictly, strictly construed. If you miss that 20 days, you're dead. Well, I would suggest that this board has the equitable authority and under the circumstances here um, really ought to ensure that um, these folks not be penalized by um, the decision of one individual to withdraw at an inopportune time. Um, the, the, the suggestion that the mere posting of a notice, wherever it might have been, and we don't know, we just know that they posted it. We don't know where. But the mere suggestion that, that the posting of a notice renders this whole issue of, of Mr. Mahan's uh, uh, awareness of the permit um, moot, I guess, is, is nonsense. Because if that were the rule, it, 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 it would swallow, the, it would swallow the, 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 the rule set by the courts. It, it can't simply be that if a permit is posted somewhere on the property next door, you are presumed to have adequate notice of the issuance of the permit. We know that can't be the case because 
Otherwise, there wouldn't be a whole line of, of, of cases that say that folks who are abutters, who are statutorily aggrieved, lacked notice. It's, it's got to be more than the issuance of the permit, and we don't know where it was, and it doesn't matter. Um, since they're making a point of it, and we're still on the procedural issue, um, I would like Mr. Katz to um, give his voice to the issue of um, his uh, presence in the district, how he's there, why he's there, and why this is an issue of immense concern to him, not simply a question of business competition, as the owner would suggest. So long as it's going to the standing point. Just to, this is just about standing. Hi, hi folks. Thanks for having me. Um, quick like a bunny. Um, uh, I did sign the, the uh, complaint. I guess that's what you call it. Um, the appeal. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> the appeal. The appeal. Thank you. Uh, for uh, as a cash royalty trust. I, nobody told me to sign it. I did not. I mean, usually, when I usually when I sign something, uh, I'll sign something as president. If I'm dealing with a Hopkinton drug, I sign it as I think Dennis Cates. I'm pretty sure. So um, I was signing as Cats Realty Trust. And then, um, in reference to the uh, competition issue, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think we we did some study. Uh, I don't know, three or four years ago. I think there's like 60 pharmacies within a five-mile radius or a 10-mile radius uh, of, of, of where we are right now. Uh, it's not a competition thing. This is, a, this is the quality of the downtown. This is, this is the, the ambience of the downtown. We have people that have come to, to, have told me that they've come to Hopkinton not because it's, it's like every other town. Uh, it's, 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 they, they don't want every other town. They don't want it to be homogenized. They want it to be unique and, 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 and have a character. And that's what we're here about. We're here about a character of a town. Not just putting a CVS and a McDonald's and a, a Dunkin' Donuts and a... Uh, it's, we don't want to be like everybody else. That's all. And, and I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Anything more on the, on the standing council? Um, no, I, I, well, the only thing I would say, and, and, and um, Council has uh, suggested this as well, is that um, you don't have to be in a butter. You don't have to be in a butter. You, you have to have a, um, a worthy interest. And again, the worthy interest here um, that is shared by all that are participating is a desire to protect the integrity of the district, which is the will of the town and to ensure that the uses within the district conform with the way the bylaw was drafted and enacted. And that's, that's real. That is a real concern. Um, it might be to some folks a generalized type concern, which I, I, I grant you the cases don't like uh, to hear about generalized concerns. This is about individualized harm. But I think that this case is, it's, it's, this is certainly different from any case where um, somebody might uh, take issue with an encroachment and a setback. I'll, I'll grant it. You, I, I think the case law would support the idea that somebody from across town can send a letter to the building commissioner seeking enforcement because they learn that somebody on the other side of the town has encroached the setback. They can do that. I don't think they can pursue it any more than that, but they can bring the issue to the attention of the building commissioner. Um, I don't think somebody from cross town would be able to articulate a um, reasonable um, personalized harm from somebody on the other side of the town encroaching a setback. Um, that's an obvious example. Um, but this case is fundamentally different. This case is about um, the, the use and development of, uh, or the development of uses within a district as defined by the parameters of the bylaw. And that is an interest that affects a great many people in a fundamentally different way. And I would suggest that um, under, the, under the particular circumstances of this case, we meet that challenge. Um, and um, there was one other thing that I wanted to add on the issue, and that is, oh, this will be my last point on, on standing, unless they come back and give me another reason to talk. Um, I've conceded nothing. 
um, the, the suggestion that, that, that I've somehow um, conceded that, that, you know, it was um, uh, that Mr. Patel's withdrawal somehow created a jurisdictional defect. I don't. I concede nothing. Um, understood. So. All right. Did you have one more? <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, I think then uh, probably be, uh, we could either get town council's point on the jurisdiction first, or we could go to that at the end. Any I think, views? I, I suggest at the end. I think that the time would be well spent to allow attorney. I think the time would be well spent to have attorney Goldberg to raise his specifics in terms of the legal question of the interpretation of the of the bylaw that was adopted uh, and the change in the uh, language and why it does or doesn't apply to the proposal that the building permit was issued for. I think I would I would suggest that before we go to that that we we hear if anyone from the public has any points on the standing issue alone. Um, Ma'am, please. You're more ecumenical than I. Again, I, you know, with, re with respect to everyone who wants to speak, this, this isn't to speak in general about the merits of, of the sp speak sp specifically to the standing issue for these appellants. I wasn't planning to speak tonight. I'm Sonia Harris. I live at 4 Marshall Avenue. Um, I just want to point out that I live very close to the parking lot behind, and my children and I uh, ride bikes there all the time. And we've been very curious about what was going in after Colella's left. And I never saw a sign anywhere posted on the building. We ride our bikes there uh, all the time. And we were always looking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Very specific. Uh, John Huber. Um, I don't think if I can just direct this question to the building inspector, I think it's very common to post a building permit inside a building. I think very few people post a paper permit on the outside of a building. And it's virtually uh, in every single building permit issue that I can ever imagine in multiple states uh, where we pull building permits. They're issued, they're posted in the premises, and they and there is really no notification that I'm aware of to the general public on a building permit. They're, they're, they're customarily issued, there's a 30-day appeal period, and that's it. And effectively, as far as constructive notice is concerned, the only other thing I would say is we were issued a demolition permit prior to the build-out permit, and we were issued actually several permits. The site went under construction sometime, I'm going to be a little bit off on this, but it went under construction sometime in June, and there were uh, backhoes, heavy equipment, street opening permits, uh, fire mains put in, uh, a tremendous amount of work was accomplished at the building, including asbestos abatement, any number of different things that went on. It would be very difficult to be an immediate and direct abutter and not to have some notice of construction activity. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public with respect to the standing issue? Okay. Then uh, Attorney Goldberg. Uh, Perhaps you could give us your, your views on the, uh, the merits. Thank you. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least make one last comment. <laughs> Briefly. Um, to my understanding, there may have been multiple permits. We're here about the permit uh, issued for the build out of the interior for use as a CVS. I don't know what the demolition permits were, but Whatever may have been going on in the property before that permit was issued is irrelevant. We're talking about the permit that brings us all here and whether Mr. Mahan or anybody else had notice of that one. Okay, Fair I'm enough. done with standing. So, why are we here? <laughs> property 61 Main Street, we all know that. It's located in the downtown business district. The downtown business district, to my understanding, was added in 2007. And I apologize in advance. I don't typically like to read because I think it's boring. But um, there's a lot that I want to be able to say and say it well, hopefully. So I may read a little bit more than I um, usually would. I'll try to ad-lib. Um, in 2012, the bylaw was amended, the Hopkinton, obviously, bylaw was amended to include a new defined use, or to their suggestion, a modified defined use, but a new defined use nonetheless, a health services facility. 
it was a revision and amendment to a previously defined medical facility. Okay. Uh, as is true of all districts uh, in the town, any uses that are not permitted by right or by special permit are prohibited. Health services facilities are prohibited in the downtown, di downtown business district because they are not permitted either by right or by special permit. It is the contention of the folks I represent that the proposed CVS pharmacy use planned for the Colella's, Colella space meets the definition of a health services facility under the bylaw. If this board agrees, it is a prohibited use, plain and simple. As I said earlier, we have a respectful, I hope, disagreement about what is or isn't a health services facility and whether CVS as a business entity is or is not. A respectful disagreement about the interpretation. And by the end of my discussion here, um, I will ask this board to find that the proposed use for 61 Main Street is in fact or in practical effect a health services facility and thus a pro prohibited use. So if this board agrees with that, then we ask the board to revoke the building permit issued to Crossport. Now, alternatively, because there's always an alternative, right? If the board determines that a pharmacy, that a pharmacy as a, as a generalized use, um, or CBS in particular, does not fall within the bylaw definition of a health services facility, it is our contention that the board nevertheless must still revoke the building permit on the basis of the fact that the pharmacy use itself, the pharmacy use itself is not allowed by right or by special permit and the general retail use is merely accessory to the non permitted principal pharmacy use. In other words, their, their argument is that we're not a health services facility, so we don't get bogged down in that quagmire. Um, but in any event, what we're proposing to install in that existing space is a retail store. And the pharmacy is simply an accessory to a principal retail use. And that's a fallacy. Because, as I'll point out, CVS, through its own filings, through its regulatory filings, through its advertising, through its marketing materials, through everything that I could find that talks about what CVS is, who CVS is, what they do, where they do it, when they do it, what they say in all, in all of their materials is, we are a health services facility. Our pharmacy, we, we are all about pharmacy uses. In fact, we are so all about pharmacy uses that the retail use is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Almost to the point where if you believe their, their 10K, their annual report submitted to the Sec Securities and Exchange Commission, I don't know how you disavow that one. If you believe that, their pharmacy is swallowing their retail use, even though, as they point out in their papers, they built this gigantic retail store and a teeny tiny little pharmacy. It's the teeny tiny little pharmacy that is generating almost all of their business. The retail is a lost leader. They want people to walk into the back of their eight, 10,000 square foot retail space walk right past the gum, the batteries, and everything else, and go back to the 900 square feet in the back where they are generating all of their income. And on those facts alone, forget about health services facility. Well, don't forget, because we're going to go there. But if this, if this board disagrees that they are a health services facility, then let's look at what they really are. They're a pharmacy. It's not a use that's permitted in the downtown business district. The retail is accessory incidental, subordinate to the pharmacy. And that turns the bylaw 
on its head. So let's start with the health services facility. They want to suggest that the pharmacy is merely a retail store because it involves the sale of prescription meds to consumers. And that's just simply too simplistic of an approach. A gas station, I mean, how many gas stations do you go to that doesn't sell, you know, Advil or Pepto-Bismol or, you know, some other medicinal product? But the sale by a gas station of a medicinal, over-the-counter medicinal product does not transform the gas station into a pharmacy. The pharmacy is something more. I hate to bring this up, but it's, you know, it proves the point. An adult bookstore is a retail store. It sells something, but it does something more, and the towns regulate it differently. A marijuana dispensary sells something to a consumer who walks in, pays money, and buys a product, but it's something more. And the bylaw creates a special sort of circumstance to handle these something more uses. The pharmacy is something more. A pharmacy is something more. Not just CVS, but any pharmacy really is something more. As I said, gas stations, grocery stores, convenience stores, they all sell some form of over-the-counter medicinal product. But nobody would characterize a gas station, a grocery store, uh, or a convenience store as a pharmacy. One does not follow the other, as CBS would seem to suggest. Um, a pharmacist is not a, 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 cash, a cashier clerk. A pharmacist provides a broad array of services, regulated services. A pharmacist, pharmacist is licensed and regulated by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts under General Laws Chapter 112, Section 24. I learned a whole lot about pharmacy handling this case. Pharmacists follow a professional code of conduct and have a legal duty to counsel patients regarding the medications they dispense and possible health effects. General Laws, Chapter 94C, Section 21A. By the way, um, we have here uh, a gentleman named Todd Brown, who is the executive director of the Independent Pharmacy Associates Association and a professor at Northeastern who knows this way better than I do. And he will um, address the board to correct me where I'm wrong and to fill in the gaps. But pharmacists have exclusive a access to buy and dispense legally controlled substances, General Laws Chapter 94C. Pharmacists are authorized to dispense medical treatments such as emergency contraception, Chapter 94C, Section 19A, and nicotine addiction therapies. Pharmacists, learn this one, pharmacists may sell alcohol without town approval under Chapter 138, Section 29. Pharmacists are mandatory reporters of abuse, along with physicians and other medical professionals, Chapter 111, Section 72G. There is no clerk in any gas station or convenience store or supermarket that does any of that. CVS, in a variety of formats, touts the broad array of services it provides. And, interestingly, CVS in their papers and in the press suggest that we are taking everything out of context. I, I find that baffling because, as I said, um, we're citing their regulatory filings, their um, marketing materials. Um, I'm going to quote uh, their executives. Um, so they're telling the world what they are and what they're becoming and what they've become, but they're disavowing all of that for the benefit of this board. Disingenuous, to say the least. CVS's marketing materials state, our more than 26,000 CVS pharmacists dispense prescriptions and provide services such as flu vaccinations, as well as face-to-face -face patient counseling with respect to adherence to drug therapies, closing gaps in care, and more cost-effective therapies. Our integrated pharmacy services model enables us to enhance access to care while helping to lower overall health care costs and improve health outcomes. That's exhibit one to our submission. It's on the website, CBS website, cbshealth.com, our business slash CBS pharmacy. CBS's 10K annual report filed with the SEC um, says the same thing, actually. <sighs> 10K. Um, 
Their words, not mine. The role of our retail pharmacist is shifting from primarily dispensing prescriptions to also providing services including flu vaccinations as well as face-to-face -face patient counseling with respect to adherence to drug therapies, closing gaps in care, and recommending more cost-effective drug therapies. Their words. I'm not making this up. What is a health services facility under the town bylaw? It is defined under Section 210-4 as a building that contains establishments dispensing health services for health maintenance and the outpatient diagnosis and treatment of medical, dental, and physical conditions, including outpatient surgery. Obviously beyond the scope of CBS, um, no question there. The term health services facility shall not include hospitals, urgent medical care requiring emergency transportation, nursing homes or extended care facilities, but may include establishments providing support to the medical profession and patients such as medical and dental laboratories, blood banks and oxygen and other miscellaneous types of medical supplies and services. That is a representative example of what can fit within a health services facility definition. It is not exclusive. It is not exhaustive. It is exemplary. <coughs> I suggest to you that CVS Pharmacy will engage in all but one of the activities within the meaning of a health services facility under the bylaw. CVS Pharmacy is an establishment that dispenses health services for health maintenance, such as screening for drug interactions and allergies, patient counseling on prescription drugs and over-the-counter medications. It performs outpatient treatment of medical and physical conditions, such as for nicotine addiction and emergency contraception. What gas station does that? Vaccinations, helping to manage chronic and specialty conditions, providing product recommendations, and answering medical questions. It provides support to the medical profession and patients by filling prescriptions, coordinating with doctor's offices and health insurance companies, keeping confidential records and serving as a mandatory reporter of abuse. It provides other miscellaneous types of medical supplies and services. The only thing CVS isn't going to do is outpatient surgery. Dispensing controlled substances, providing vaccinations, counseling patients face-to-face -face with respect to drug therapies are all activities that squarely fall within the activities set forth by the bylaw definition of a health services facility. Following protocols to interview a patient and dispense emergency contraception is outpatient diagnosis and treatment of a physical condition. Dispensing prescriptions is a support to the medical profession because only physicians are legally authorized to write prescriptions. I would suggest that pharmaceutical advice and products by all definitions fall within the category of other miscellaneous types of medical services and supplies. Again, the use of the phrase such as in the town's bylaw signals that the listed examples are intended to be illust illustrative, not exhaustive. In a, in a letter to the Board of Selectmen uh, by Town Council Raymond uh, Miares, I don't know if I pronounced that right, points to instances in the zoning bylaws where the sale of medications is made in reference to retail uses allowed as of right, with all due respect to town council. The point he's making is that if you look at each of the districts, each of the district definitions in the bylaw, there's a reference to the sale of medications. Um, the problem with that is it's in the context of all non-pharmacy retail establishments. Um, in, anywhere in this town, w within the definition of the district, uh, definition of the districts under the bylaw, there can be the sale of over-the-counter medicinal products. That's, that's the sections of the bylaw that town council was pointing to. Not, if you look at it, it, it's not a reflection of where in this town pharmacy uses can um, occur or not occur. It's simply a recognition that medicines can be sold, over-the-counter medicines, medicines can be sold. Again, it's, it's not simply the act of selling aspirin or any other number of over-the-counter products that you can buy in any type of establishment, establishment around the town that gives rise to a, a creature that we call a pharmacy, a statutorily regulated creature called a pharmacy. Again, not again, C CVS self-identifies as a health services provider over and over and over again. Um, its, its chief medical officer, named Troy Brennan, made the following statement regarding corporate strategy in late 2014. This is a quote. It's commonly believed that CVS has a pharmacy in the back to lure people through the front of the store whose product sales are the real goal. 
That's what CVS wants this board to, to, to determine, that the sale of the products in the front of the store is the real goal. Because if that was the case, it would be a retail store. It's commonly believed that CVS has a pharmacy in the back to lure people through the front of the store whose product sales are the real goal. But the opposite is true. And in fact, um, this is a quote in an interview. He, in fact, he said, front store sales account for only 30%, going down to 20% of total store revenue. And that percentage will continue to decline. So this is a statement in late 2004 by CVS's chief medical officer commenting on the, the operation of the type of store that CVS is proposing to place in the downtown business district. Um, by the way, this is exhibit three to our submission. It's an article entitled Morphing CVS into a Healthcare Delivery Company written by Hogue Levins in LDI Health Economist November 2014. Um, Mr. Troy is also, I'm sorry, Mr. Brennan is also quoted as saying, retail pharmacies had always operated on the outside of the healthcare delivery system, but that CVS had a strategic structure that could enable it to creep, <coughs> creep, the word creep was in quotes, in and become an integral part of that delivery system. In a May, 20, May 25th, 2015 article, uh, entitled Pharmacies Do More Than Dispense Drugs. CVS's Executive Vice President of Pharmacy Services named Josh Flume, F-L-U-M, made the following statement, quote, community pharmacy practice is evolving from being just a dispenser of medications to a provider of services. Whether it is, whether it is by providing medication counseling, influencing patients about the importance of medication adherence, administering vaccinations, or helping patients understand complex drug therapy issues. CVS pharmacists are playing an increasingly important role as health care providers in their communities." Unquote. That's Exhibit 12. Now, I want to be careful. Mr. Gilbert, just, just to interrupt briefly, I, sure. I don't want to discourage you from, from going through your evidence, but uh, you know, you're citing things that are in, are in your materials and I have read them, and, and I'm conscious that we're limited on time. So um, unless we're going to carry over to another hearing, you know, probably a week or two from now, um, which I don't think any of us really wants to do if we can avoid it, um, I, I just ask if you can refer briefly to your materials, if, if you can. Um, I appreciate that point taken. I, I do want to ensure that I present as thoroughly as I believe I need to in order to get the points across. But I, Fair I, enough. I just want to make the point. Um, in its marketing materials and in its SEC filings and its press releases, CVS describes itself as a CVS, it's another quote, uh, exhibit nine. CVS Health is a pharmacy innovation company, helping people on their path to better health. It refers to its 7,800 retail pharmacies, um, walk-in medical clinics. That's in the quote. I understand this, there's no minute clinic here, but the important thing is that the, the the characterization that I read previously about what a pharmacist does and the services that a pharmacist provides, and the health delivery services and the ancillary support that a pharmacist provides is all about pharmacists. This isn't this this language that's being quoted. In your, in your materials is not a discussion about CVS's minute clinics. This is about pharmacists. And I understand and, and recognize that there's no minute clinic being proposed for this site. But we're not talking about, we're not talking about the health services provided in minute clinics. We're talking about the delivery of health services by pharmacists. Um, I won't read this in all its gory detail, but I think it's important to note that, again, pharmacists are highly regulated. It's defined as a health care service, that health care services is defined to include pharmaceutical services and products. Um, the practice, practice of pharmacy is regulated by the Department of Public Health. Um, there's a code of conduct. Um, I, I think the, 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 the message should be clear enough that they don't, they being pharmacies, and CVS in particular, because that's why we're here, they don't simply sell a product. They are not simply a retail operation selling a product. They are much more than that. They are in the business, the very lucrative business, of delivering health 
services in support of the medical profession to ensure the health and well-being of their customers. Not simply taking money for a product, but delivering something very much more. And that very much more fits within the definition of a health services facility. It is a broadly worded definition. I, I didn't write it. Um, and the town, the town um, amended medical facility, called it health services facility, tinkered with the language, and this town is left with precisely what the bylaw provides. And whether it was contemplated or not, um, the, 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 the fact remains that the definition casts a very wide net. And it is our position that the net is wide enough to capture the type of health-related services that are delivered by a pharmacist within a pharmacy. And therefore, it meets the definition. If it meets the definition, it is a prohibited use because it is not allowed either by right or by special permit in the downtown business district. It's really not much more complicated than that. And despite um, cross points or CVS's um, best um, argument, you, you cannot, they cannot walk away from, they cannot distance themselves from their own words, their own filings, their own regulatory filings, their, their own obligations under Massachusetts statute and the code of mass regulations which compel pharmacists <coughs> to do a large number of things within the scope of their, of their license. They cannot walk away from all that, but they want to. So that's really all I have to say about health services facility un until I can respond to um, comments from uh, Cross Points Council. But let me, let me move to the, um, the secondary argument that I have, which is that even if, even if this board disagrees or finds that CVS, a CVS pharmacy, or any pharmacy really, I mean, it's not just CVS, it's pharmacy in the general sense. If this board finds that a pharmacy is not within, does not meet the definition of health services facility, then CVS, as the um, beneficiary of the building permit, um, allowing the build out of the building for the use that's proposed, they are, um, by any rational view of the evidence before you, um, the pharmacy is the principal use. The retail is accessory. And that just turns the bylaw on its head. So an accessory use under the town's bylaw is defined as a building, structure, or use, we're talking about use, that is customarily incidental and subordinate to the lawful <coughs> principal use of the lot and is located on the same lot as the principal use or building. An accessory use must not be the primary use of the property, but rather one that is subordinate and minor in significance. Subordinate and minor in significance has a reasonable relationship with the primary use and is one that is usual to maintain in connection with the primary use in the lot. Um, I hate to do this. Let me backtrack for one second, and I'll, and I'll go back to the, this argument, but I, it's important for me to, to uh, make one other comment on the health services piece. Um, Crosspoint cites only two cases. Um, seems there's not a whole lot of law on some of the issues that we have before us, which is not particularly helpful, but Crosspoint cites only two cases, cites two cases for the proposition that, I think their proposition is that a pharmacy, as a matter of law, is a retail use. Um, I think that's what they're trying to get from the cases, but the cases don't say that. One case is the Conlin case, uh, which is a, I think a 2008 case had to do with the um, development of a Walgreens um, in Somerset, Mass. And um, I won't go into, I'm not going to go into the case in great detail, but it's important to note that, um, just bear with me for one second. Yeah, 2008 case, it's a land court case. Um, 
And I, what, what seems clear to me, and I, and I, I urge the board to read, read the cases if you haven't already, but what, what, seems, what seems evident to me is that um, it just so happened that these two cases um, had the word retail and the word pharmacy in them, in the case. Um, and there's this sort of anecdotal, um, almost parenthetical suggestion that um, in the facts of the case, uh, there's a statement that, uh, uh, um, you know, in the district there are a number of businesses, um, A, B, C, D, E, and a pharmacy. And, they, and they're described as retail. Um, so what Crosspoint wants to get from these cases is that because there's another decision out there, um, a land court decision out there that talks about a pharmacy and talks about retail in the same case, that that somehow um, means that as a matter of law, a pharmacy is a retail use. It, the cases don't say that at all. It, the, the cases don't talk about what a pharmacy is. They don't talk about whether a pharmacy is a retail. They don't talk about what the town's bylaw requires or doesn't require or permits or doesn't permit in respect to the question that is before this board. I would suggest that neither of the cases provide any controlling or, or even illustrative guidance to this board. The other case that they cite for the same proposition is this Petros case, which is from 1940. Um, this is a comical one. This is about killing chickens. And th this, this, the only issue that was before the court was whether the killing of a chicken in, this, in, in respect to a business that sold freshly killing chick killed chickens was incidental or somehow transformed the business into a statutorily regulated slaughterhouse. And the court, the court basically concluded that killing a chicken for the purposes of selling a freshly killed chicken was incidental. Um, and again, there's a reference in the case to the fact that the building that housed this chicken business also housed a number of other businesses, other retail businesses, including pharmacy. I, I would suggest that um, there's nothing about uh, Petros, a 1940 decision about the slaughter of chickens that makes a passing reference to a pharmacy being located within the building provides any, um, any guidance to this board as to the issues that are before you now. Again, there's no discussion about wh what a pharmacy is, how it relates to retail, if it does or it doesn't, or whether there was something about the, the bylaw in effect in 1940 that would have even created that issue. The fact of the matter is, neither one of these cases raise any discussion, even remotely hint at any discussion, um, that would help this board make a decision. Okay. So back to primary and accessory use. Um, I read the definition of the town's definition of accessory use. Um, I, I cited, uh, I think I cited in, in well, in, in Garabedian versus Westland, and I, I don't remember if I said it or not. If not, I can provide it to the board. But the appeals court stated that an incidental use is one that is dependent on or pertains to the principal or main use. It also said that incidental meant the use was subordinate and minor in significance, and it said that the word also connotes something minor or of lesser importance. Um, that, that case law language is consistent with this town's definition of an accessory use. An accessory must not be primary. It must be subordinate. It must be minor in significance. It has to have a reasonable relationship with the primary use and one that is usual to maintain in connection with the primary use. So I, I, I go back to, um, and I'm trying not to belabor any of this, um, believe me, but I go back to the quote from CVS's chief medical officer, Troy Brennan. It, it, it fits with this argument as well. This is the quote. It's commonly believed that CVS has a pharmacy in the back to lure people through its front, through the front of the store, whose product sales are the real goal. But the opposite is true. And in fact, front store sales account for only 30% going down to 20 of total store revenue, and that percentage will continue to decline. Again, that's Exhibit 3. Now, if you, if you look at CVS's annual report to the SEC, filed December 31st, 2014, CVS reports percent net of revenue. And I have an, I don't know if I, sum, I, I don't know if I submitted the SEC. Um, I did, okay. So the CVS's, CVS's um, 
annual report says that prescription drugs in 2014 accounted for 70.7% net revenues. That over-the-counter and personal care products in 2014 accounted for 11%. Beauty and cosmetics in 2014 accounted for 4.7%. And general merchandise other in 2014 accounted for 13.6%. So based, based on the net the percentage of net revenue, not square footage of the store, but the percent of net revenue. What are they doing in the store? What are they promoting in the store? What are they, what are they, what business are they generating within the space? Based on the percent of net revenues, the pharmacy use can't, under any rational interpretation, be considered incidental and subordinate to the store's general retail use. 70 to 80 percent of revenue cannot be subordinate and incidental to 20 to 30 percent of revenue. We just can't. I, I think, I think Crosspoint points out in their papers that the the, the pharmacy portion of the building only accounts for 6.7% of the space, something like that. Um, but, I mean, that would be like saying that 94% of the space is warehouse use. We don't do anything. We use it for storage. And we really want people to walk into the back of the building. It's, they could build a warehouse. They could build a million square foot box and generate 30% of their business in, you know, 999,000 square feet of space, and in that 1% generate 80% of the business, and, and they want to call that retail as the predominant primary use and pharmacy accessory. It's nonsense. The reality, the practical reality of what's going on and what's proposed and what they've told the world is that 70 80% and climbing is pharmacy use. 20 to 30 percent and decreasing is retail use. It would be shocking to me that that, that scenario meets the definition of accessory, meets the definition or the meaning of incidental and subordinate. I, I just don't, I don't know how. Um, I do. So I, I, I will be quiet now um, un until given a chance to respond to um, Crosspoint's uh, argument. But I would, uh, before I cede the floor to them, I would like uh, Mr. Brown to um, uh, address the board and provide some filler, um, or maybe correct me where I'm wrong, in terms of pharmacy and pharmacists and their obligations and what they do. Um, Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, my name is Todd Brown. I'm a licensed pharmacist in Massachusetts. I've been licensed to practice for 30 years. As uh, Attorney Goldberg said, I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Independent Pharmacists Association and have held that position for 18 years. I'm also a professor at Northeastern University in the School of Pharmacy, and I've been there for 26 years. Um, I think uh, Attorney Goldberg pretty much uh, covered most of the points. I just want to make two uh, brief points. Um, Attorney Goldberg mentioned uh, various services that pharmacies provide that are kind of over and above what you would think uh, are retail services, uh, emergency contraception, immunization, things like that. Uh, recently, in order to deal with uh, uh, the opioid abuse epidemic in Massachusetts, the Department of Public Health has authorized community pharmacies to dispense and provide education on the use of naloxone, which is the antidote for, um, for opiates. Um, and uh, many pharmacies are doing that. The Department of Public Health has a list of pharmacies that are providing those services. And included in that list is every CVS pharmacy in the state. 
And so that I would just point out that that's another example of pharmacies providing services that are over and above uh, those that are retail services. Um, but the bigger point that I want to make is that pharmacists, the role of the pharmacist has changed. Pharmacists are the drug expert no matter where they practice, and that also includes in community pharmacies. It's very common for prescribers to call a pharmacy to ask for advice when prescribing medication. It's very common for pharmacists to contact the prescriber when there's a problem with the medication that they've prescribed. As a matter of fact, pharmacists are, are responsible for doing this. If they don't do these services, if they don't evaluate the drug therapy, or if they don't educate the patient appropriately on the use of the medication, they're actually held liable for these. And so these are not services that you would think just a normal retail establishment uh, would provide. Um, and it's gone even above that. Uh, is pharmacists, community pharmacists that are partnering with prescribers to actually manage the patient's medication therapy. So the prescriber might diagnose the patient and then uh, transition the patient to the community pharmacist and then they would manage the patient's whole drug therapy based upon a protocol that's been predetermined by the pharmacist and the prescriber. And so these are examples of, of the role of the community pharmacists that go over and above um, those that you would think a retail establishment would provide. And I believe that those type of activities uh, would classify community pharmacies as meeting the definition of providing support to the medical profession and patients. And so because of that, I would contend that pharmacies are health service facilities. Thank you, sir. Um, before Attorney Goldberg steps back up, does any of the board have questions? No. This gentleman? Yes. No. Yes. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you. Um, the last thing I want to say, last thing for now, it's a is um, just to address one other, one other comment uh, or one other piece of, of Crosspoint's argument, which is, Pharmacies have always been regulated as a retail use in the town of Hopkinton, or I think they would rather say universally, but for our purposes, they suggest that it's always been regulated as a retail use. They point to reference from town council's letter, which suggests that it's always been regulated as a retail use. Maybe so, but we're here. We have a new section of the bylaw. We have a, a question about the interpretation of the bylaw. And we have a question about not just the interpretation of the bylaw, whether the pharmacy use meets the definition, but whether a use that is, in reality, primary, not secondary, whether that meets the definition of accessory use if it doesn't meet the def definition of health services. So, it's not about whether this town has always done something in the past for similar uses or whether in some universal sense pharmacies statewide or townwide have been regulated a certain way. It's about whether the use proposed for 61 Main Street under the circumstances presented in light of the bylaw that exists today is a permissible use and, and therefore it is, it is a it is an appropriate question, it's an important question, and it's one that um, we respectfully ask this board to make, um, obviously, um, consistent with the arguments that we've made. Thanks. Thank you. All right. What, what's your pleasure in terms of the best way to proceed? Should we be questioning the applicant? Should we be listening to the counterproposal by Crosspoint. I don't, I don't, what do you think is the best way to get out our questions and all our knowledge? Oh, I'm, I'm certainly open to suggestions from the board, but um, I, I think as we're likely to hear from applicant at the end again anyway, we might reserve our questions for him then. Um, so as we maximize our chance to get the comments of the public in tonight, um, if we run out of time, I'm sure applicants' council will be back. Um, but um, 
So why don't we move then, unless the board has other thoughts, um, to um, cross points. Well, first, let me say Mike's uh, points, if he has any, and then cross points. I think that would be great to balance the legal with the legal. Yeah. Ah, please, please proceed. <clears throat> Pro literally, proceed to the, <laughs> to the dias and then proceed. <laughs> Members of the board, my name is Mike Shepard. I'm uh, the assistant building inspector in the town of Hopkinton. Um, the, the appellants uh, approached me well before I actually issued this permit. And um, I met with them shortly after I issued it. Uh, the day I issued it, I emailed them and told them that I was issuing it um, and the reasons, therefore, and I'll get to that. Um, but first, um, a, a lot of people, you know, there's a pretty awesome responsibility making zoning determinations. A lot of people don't think so, but we do it every day. We do really easy ones that appear before the board, like side setbacks, rear setbacks, that kind of stuff. And we do more difficult ones. And this one going in, I know, is a more difficult one. And I spent a lot of time with it. I got voluminous amounts of information from the appellants on why they thought it was something that I thought it wasn't. And I read all that information. And in the end, after thinking on it and, and, and working on it, I came to the decision I, I did. I've been in town probably as much as long as anybody in this room. Um, in fact, my wife used to work at Katz's for Dennis's dad at the soda fountain um, back in the 60s. Um, and um, it, although, you know, I, I, I probably appear to most people to be a you know, a, a small town boy and, and a project of the Hopkins education system, I, I, would, I would submit to you that I'm actually a little bit more than that. You know, after I left Hopkins, I went to Fitchburg State College and got a degree as a teacher. After that, I went to the Marine Corps and served seven years as a captain of infantry uh, Marines, including a tour in Vietnam. When I came back from that, I was seven years a teacher in uh, the town of Weston. During that period, I got a master's degree from Pepperdine University. After that, when I decided I didn't want to teach anymore and I had to raise a family and put food on the table, I went into business by, for myself. And I, and I worked, 95% of my work was right here in town. I hardly ever left town. Um, after my knees gave out and, you know, for one reason or another, I couldn't pound nails anymore. And <clears throat> Mr. Bowker was leaving this position. I decided this might be a good place to be. And, you know, not thinking about the, the zoning ramifications. I knew all about the building stuff. That's easy. The zoning stuff is a little bit harder. So I did that. Um, and I appeared, I was probably the first one uh, building inspector ever to appear before all the boards of appeals and all the hearings without getting a special request for me to appear. I was here, and then I went to the town Brookline, and I served as a zoning enforcement officer, then the building commissioner for Brookline. And about that time, birthdays caught up with me, and you know, I decided it was time to retire. So I retired from Brookline three years ago, and Chuck called me up and had this big project going down at Western Nurseries. He needed some help, so I worked part-time. But the only reason I give you this is, is because I, I do actually have some background to be able to figure out these kind of things. I'm not a hick from the woods. I'm, I, I do spend a lot of time. I have an incredible amount of respect for our community, you know, and I'll say flat out that I really don't like the fact that CVS is going downtown, but I'll also say flat out I don't have a choice. The, uh, I'm the one that sits in a room by himself and makes the decisions. At the end of the day, I'm the guy that gets appealed. And I'm really happy that the appellants are here tonight because they're here tonight because they asked me what they could do and I said appeal. That's why they're here. And, you know, and I'm happy they're here, and I'm happy that everybody will get to be heard. Um, getting down to the, to the, the, the facts of the case, um, the appellants um, hang their hat on this definition of health services facility. And back in 2012, the, 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 uh, not the definition was changed. The definition is the same, but it was changed from medical center to health services facility. And the planning board normally presents these changes at town meeting. 
and I have the script from the planning board here of what they said about this change. The amendments are proposed to reflect the changes in the manner of health care service delivery over the years and to accommodate the use in zoning districts where it is appropriate based upon their location and mix of uses already allowed there. The proposed changes are to change the term from medical center to health services facility wherever it appears and to modify the definition and make it clear it's an outpatient facility and not an emergency treatment facility or hospital. Nowhere when they made that description or they presented the town meeting that said now pharmacies are allowed, pharmacies are not allowed. Pharmacies were never mentioned. Ever. Say, of course they In town we have a really long history yeah, and I'll remind a lot of people that you know we have in the business district, the downtown business districts, one of the allowed uses is mortuaries. It's not an accident that that's an allowed use. That was made as part of the zoning bylaw in 1954 because one existed here. They didn't want to make something that was pre-existing non-conforming. They just didn't want to do that. We did it down the lake when we put in boathouses. Boathouses are allowed down the lake. They're not allowed anyplace else in town because people had boathouses down the lake. They said, yeah, they're allowed by right. So I would contend that if you say that pharmacies, by whatever definition, are not allowed, I would expect Mr. Katz would have raised hell two years ago at town meeting because his business then would have become pre-existing non-conforming. The town doesn't do that. The town would have specifically allowed pharmacies because Dennis was there. He's a respected member of the community and he's always been there as I represent when, you know, I used to get out and oh, I feed me sodas at the soda fountain. But the, the uh, so they wouldn't have made it pre-existing non-conforming. They would have said specifically, Pharmacies are not allowed, or pharmacies are allowed, or even they would have said pharmacies are part of this definition. They didn't say that anywhere. Nowhere in this. And I've read it 5,000 times. Okay? So <clears throat> then it gets down to the basic fact. What do they do at pharmacies? Of course they, they dispense drugs. That's, that's obvious. And whether CBS sells, you know, film and, and lipstick and batteries and hearing aids, it doesn't matter. They sell it all at retail. The package stores in town, they dispense booze. They're regulated by the Board of Selectmen and the ABCC, and they dispense the booze. There it's a retail use, strongly regulated. Now, I would suspect being 70 some odd years old now and using for, you know, a lot more pharmaceutical things than I need and seeing a lot more ads on TV, a lot about the fact that pharmacists have to get involved in counseling people like me is a lot of it is liability. A lot of it is liability on the part of the pharmaceutical company that's selling it to the drugstore that sells it to me. A lot of it is the, the doctors are dependent upon the pharmacies to actually explain to people how to use it and when to use it because they don't have time to do it. But I do know for a fact when I go to dentists to get drugs, or I go to CVS in, in Westboro to get drugs, or if I go to Walgreens to get drugs, I pay cold hard money. And in my book, that's retail. I'm buying a, a, a product for cash that I earned. That's a retail use. And just as much if I got buy a fifth of booze from the package store or buy a gun from a gun store. It's still retail. This little yogurt place downstairs, it's not a restaurant, it's a, it's a retail use. They're just selling a product, it happens to be yogurt. These guys, whether it's Dennis or CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, they're selling a product that happens to be drugs. They're counseling probably not because they really want to, although I do respect the profession, they're, you know, but if, if I'm sick, I go to a doctor, the doctor tells me what's wrong, prescribes the drugs, and I go to Dennis. I don't go to Dennis to find out what's wrong with me. Some people may. Mm -hmm. I go to Dennis to buy the damn drugs. Thank you. Sure. Uh, ah, I'm sorry. Any questions? Any, any questions? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, then I think <laughs> that should have been a cue. Um, then I, I think, why don't we turn to uh, Hopkins and CP then, and uh, as I understand it, uh, it's uh, Bowditch and Dewey. Um, Ms. Peasy? Yes, thank you. 
Good evening, members of the board. My name is Marissa Pizzi of Bowditch and Dewey. Um, I'm representing Hopkinton CPLLC tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I know it's getting late in the evening, and I will try to, to be as brief as possible. Um, I do think uh, the issue, the, the issue before the board here, whether the proposed CVS is an allowed use, um, is really not all that complicated, um, and hardly one that requires, I think, expert testimony. Um, I do think it's important to to clarify. Um, what I at least view as a, as a critical issue. Um, throughout Attorney Goldberg's presentation, we heard repeated reference to CVS, over and over again, CVS. Um, what we didn't hear from Attorney Goldberg was that largely, virtually all of the materials um, in the appellant's package, with reference to CVS, um, refer to CVS Health, which is not the tenant at 61 Main Street. Um, it is the parent organization, um, but it is not the tenant. And the real issue before this board is, is a very narrow one, and that is whether the proposed use at this particular site at 61 Main Street by the actual tenant, which is CVS Pharmacy, Inc., is allowed as a retail use. The types of services that may be provided by CVS Health as the parent organization either online or at any of the other thousands of locations throughout the country um, is not relevant. Crosspoint's lease is with CVS Pharmacy, Inc., not CVS Health. CVS Pharmacy, Inc. is a registered foreign corporation in Massachusetts, and, it for, and it's registered for the purpose of doing business as a retail pharmacy chain. And we provided, um, as Exhibit D to our memorandum, a copy of the 2000 annual report um, filed by CVS Pharmacy Inc., which specifically lists there as its business purpose, retail pharmacy chain. CVS Health, upon which, again, the appellants focus um, primarily in their materials, um, includes many different subsidiary services beyond just the retail business that will be located at 61 Main Street. Um, it is important to note that CVS Pharmacy is the retail division of CVS Health. And it continues to be called CVS Pharmacy. Its name has not changed. It's the parent organization, CVS, CVS Health, which we've heard has undergone this name change. However, its retail division is still referred to as CVS Pharmacy, Inc. And that is actually referenced um, directly in the materials that the appellants filed. Um, in various places, in Exhibits 1 and 10, you will see reference to the fact that the CVS Pharmacy is the retail division of CVS Health. You heard reference to the SEC filing. Um, that was made by CVS. Again, that would be CVS Health that made that CVS, that made that SEC filing. Um, and even there, it makes clear that there are different segments of CVS Health, only one of which, or one of which, is the retail pharmacy. So CVS Health does include other segments beyond the retail business. CVS Health, that is. Um, there's the Minute Clinic, the CVS Minute Clinic, which, as we know, is not going to be offered at this location. Um, it also, CVS Health also includes pharmacy benefit management um, services, uh, known as CVS Caremark. Uh, there's also specialty pharmacist services, known as CVS Specialty. Um, again, these all fall within the umbrella of CVS Health, but not relevant to the issue before the board, which is the retail division, CVS Pharmacy. And if you look at, um, and I have... Well, I'll get to that in a minute, I guess. If you look at the preliminary merchandise plan that was actually submitted with the building permit application that was approved by the building inspector, which is what is directly on appeal here, you will see that the entire space is allotted for retail purposes, whether pharmacy or otherwise. And we maintain that the pharmacy is part of the retail use, not an accessory use. It could be viewed as an, alter as an alternative, and I'll get to that. Alternatively, you could, you could call it an accessory use. But I think in the first instance, it is part and parcel of the retail use. Um, and that's, again, that plan is, is Exhibit F to the memorandum. Um, and, I, and that would obviously exclude the, you know, smaller locations for the manager's office, the stock area, toilets, that kind of thing. Um, I have, uh, I don't know if the board can see this, and I have smaller, smaller versions of this plan which I can hand out. Perhaps we can put this in front somewhere. 
if you want to. Chuck, you got them? We, um, this, is a, this is basically virtually identical to the, to the plan that's included as Exhibit F in your, um, and Ben, if you want to provide one to Attorney <coughs> Goldberg as well. Yeah. This is essentially the same preliminary merchandise plan. Um, the, the, the only difference with this plan is that um, the departments are more clearly labeled and it's colorized so you can see in the, in the actual plan that is attached that was filed with the building permit application the words are very small and you can see in various places where there's going to be health and beauty and stationary but we we made an effort to just clearly label the departments um, and to colorize it so it could be easier to read um, but ultimately it shows the same thing and that is a net retail area of 12,174 square feet, including the pharmacy. And again, to be clear, the pharmacy, which primarily sells prescription drugs, is part of the retail use. Um, and I would submit that, and, and I would like to respond to Attorney Goldberg's um, argument that, that really what dictates is the, is the revenue. Um, and as a matter of zoning classification, zoning classifications are based on the use of land or structures, not on revenues. Um, and if we were to categorize the primary or dominant use based on revenues, um, then from a zoning standpoint, the use of any particular property could constantly be in flux because revenues increase, revenues decrease. I guess that would mean that the use would constantly be subject to change. And that is not how, at least as I understand it, from a, of a zoning class, from, for purposes of classifying uh, use for purposes of zoning, um, that is, that's simply not how it's, it's looked at. Um, so the retail is, I mean, so the pharmacy is part of the retail use. Um, again, primarily the sale of prescription drugs, that is retail. Um, even if you were to consider it as an accessory use, again, it's only 7.5% of the net retail space um, or 6.4% 6, 6 of the gross square footage of the store, depending on how you look at it. Um, so the question then is, what does, what does retail mean? Um, and the question really is, what does retail mean within the context of the Hopkinton zoning bylaw? Um, and I would submit that the building inspector properly concluded that the proposed CVS pharmacy store is a retail use. Um, as the board knows, the zoning bylaw does not define retail. Um, however, as Attorney Goldberg has acknowledged, historically pharmacies such as Hopkinton Drug have been consistently regulated as retail uses, and this has been confirmed by Town Council Ray Miares. Um, in addition, Massachusetts courts dictate that in the absence of an express definition, the meaning of a word or phrase used in a local zoning bylaw is to be determined by the ordinary principles of statutory construction. Um, and I think that's an important point because it was not something that was um, referenced by the appellants. This is not an exercise in which we determine what retail means in a vacuum. Um, there's case law that talks about principles of statutory construction. And what that means is that a zoning bylaw should be construed sensibly with regard to its underlying purposes and, if possible, as a harmonious whole. And two, that we derive the words usual and accepted meanings from sources presumably known to the bylaws and actors, such as their use in other legal contexts and dictionary definitions. Um, so contrary to the appellant's position, and something they say in their memorandum, that any reliance on dictionary definitions for what retail is is too simplistic of an approach or, or improper, as I think what they said. Um, in fact, that is exactly what the law requires in the absence of an express definition, and that is exactly what, what happened in this case. Uh, both the building inspector and other town officials appropriately considered the dictionary definition of retail. And the generally accepted definition of retail, at least according to Webster's Dictionary, is to sell something to customers for their own use, to be sold to the final customer for a specified price to sell something to one person after another, and or to sell something again. Black's Law Dictionary, which I, I don't believe is referenced in our memorandum, but also similarly defines retail as a sale for final consumption in contrast to a sale for further sale or processing, i.e. wholesale. And then it goes on to say a sale to the ultimate consumer. Again, 
the, oh, take a step back actually, these definitions include the sale of all products that can be found at CVS, whether that's beauty, stationery, or prescription medications. Applying the principles of statutory construction here leads to the inevitable result that retail stores include pharmacies. And again, the term retail includes pharmacies, particularly as applied in Hopkinton, or that it does, is reinforced by the fact that, that pharmacies have consistently been regulated in Hopkinton as retail uses. Um, and indeed, many of the products that will be sold at CVS will overlap with the items that were sold at Colella's and are, and are also sold at Hopkinton Drug. And again, I want to emphasize that the building inspector, town council, and other town officials, including the town manager, with their many years of experience and history in Hopkinton, have all confirmed this interpretation. I want to turn now for a minute to the, to the issue of health services facility. Um, because, and of course, because the proposed, it's our position that because the proposed CVS pharmacy is a retail store, it is not a quote unquote health services facility as that term is defined in the Hopkinton zoning bylaw. To characterize the proposed CVS pharmacy as a health services facility completely disregards the actual services that will be provided at 61 Main Street. It ignores, the meaning, it ignores the meaning, purpose, and intent of the 2012 zoning bylaw amendment, which we heard from the building inspector, that changed the term medical center to health services facility. Now, I understand that, that Mr. Pierce was on the zoning advisory committee that recommended uh, the bylaw amendment, and, and Ms. Lazarus participated in the meetings where the planning board considered the amendment and recommended its adoption. So, so I, certainly there is some knowledge and experience on the part of the board and other town officials as to why that bylaw amendment was proposed and what it was intended to do. Um, one of the most important points to make about the 2012 zoning amendment is that it did not introduce a new use category. And as again, as we've heard, it, it rather it changed the definition of medical center and replaced that with the current definition of health services facility. And in fact, the definition of health services facility closely tracks the prior definition of medical center. Um, and we've actually, in, in, on page nine of our memorandum, we've quoted the provision with the new language in italics and underlines so that you can actually see the t what the changes were from the old definition to the new definition. And to a large extent, the definition didn't change dramatically. Um, the appellants relying upon the definition for health services facility argue that the proposed CVS pharmacy is an establishment that, quote, dispenses health services for health maintenance and, quote, provides support to the medical profession and patients. However, this language was part of the prior definition of medical center. It's not, was not added in the, in the, by the 2012 amendment. Um, so this would suggest and would lead to the absurd result that CVS would have been, and under the old bylaw, categorized as a medical center by the, by the appellant's argument. And by the same logic, other pharmacies in town, such as Hopkinton Drug, also would have been class classified as medical centers and not as retail uses prior to the 2012 zoning amendment. And I would submit that that just simply doesn't make sense and, was not in t and is not what was intended by the 2012 bylaw amendment. The 2012 amendment made the use, then medical center, now health services facility, more permissive. It changed the use to one allowed by special permit in the rural business, industrial A and industrial B zoning districts, to a use allowed by right in those districts. The amendment also allowed the use by right in the office park zoning district, where the use had been previously prohibited. The meeting minutes from both the planning board and the zoning advisory committee at the time state that the reasoning behind the proposed changes was to allow medical facilities and to accommodate the use. In other words, the modifications were intended to be less restrictive to attract those uses. And that's what was intended by the 2012 amendment. There is absolutely nothing in the history, of the, in the history or the language of the amendment that suggests that the amendment was intended to prohibit pharmacies in certain districts where they had been previously allowed as retail uses. And if such a drastic change in the meaning of medical center had been intended, it would have been mentioned by either the planning board 
or the Zoning Advisory Committee when they considered the amendment. To suggest such a drastic change in zoning, and it's not as, as the build as we heard from the building inspector, was not even, no mention of pharmacy is even made in connection with the amendment. It simply was not the intention of that amendment. And it's simply not how it's been applied in the town of Hopkinton. And again, to the contrary, town council has indicated, town council Ramiaris, that health services facilities have been understood not to include pharmacies within the meaning of Hopkinton zoning bylaws. And I think Mr. Miyares, and, and I believe it was in his letter to the Board of Selectmen, makes another important point, which is that whether or not CVS Pharmacy can be com considered to provide what someone, might cons be, what someone might consider a health service, as that term may be generally defined, is not the issue. The issue is whether or not it is a quote-unquote health services facility, as this town has defined that term in its zoning bylaws. And, and as that term has been applied to uses in the town of Copkington. And clearly, health services facility was not intended to, to apply to pharmacies, has not been interpreted to apply to pharmacies. And in fact, pharmacies have historically and consistently been treated as retail uses, which is consistent with um, what a retail use, again, under the principles of statutory construction, um, what a retail, retail, what the meaning of retail is under those mm. principles. And so I would submit to the board um, that simply put, the proposed CVS pharmacy is allowed by right as a retail use in the downtown business district. I don't have anything else if the board has questions. I'm sure we do have questions, but as we reserved for Attorney Goldberg, I, I would suggest we reserve our questions for you until later. I, I suspect we're going to run out of time tonight. I'd like to try and get through the public who's turned out and been very patient <laughs> waiting through all of this. Um, so uh, I think let's, yeah, let's, let's hear from any members of the public at this point uh, that, that want to speak on the, the issue of health service facility um, or pharmacy, for that matter. Um, as I said at the outset, though, um, I'll, although I recognize that certainly there's a lot of opinions about, uh, about this as a particular tenant and, and what have you and a lot of preferences, um, you know, those issues don't, don't go to the merits here. And so I'll ask people who, who'd like to speak to please confine it to, um, you know, to the legal questions before the board about whether this falls within the definition in the bylaw. So with that. Um, Joe Antaki, 118 Pond Street. I'm a, a licensed practicing physician in Massachusetts. I've been for about 27 years, 26 years. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when it comes to delivering health services, uh, as has been stated before, the uh, pharmacy contains a pharmacist who's a licensed professional that, as has been said, is obligated to advise me, and as they have over the years, um, have advised me, and they also have an obligation to actually not fill a prescription if they feel that it is an error. So I do feel that uh, a pharmacy is more than a re retail store. It contains a licensed professional that is uh, supporting the delivery of health care as so stated in the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Scott Richardson, uh, President of the Hopkinton Chamber of Commerce, and I was a member of the Zoning Advisory Committee in 2012 uh, that we helped uh, kind of re modify the bylaw, as you had heard previously, and I just wanted to reiterate that there was never any intent to uh, identify pharmacies as healthcare care facilities, uh, nor to dis uh, disallow them in any district uh, relative to that amendment to the bylaw. Um, if I may, while you're here, um, was there ever any discussion of pharmacies in the context of that amendment? There was not, to my recollection, no. If I may, um, retail, uh, the definition of retail is kind of interesting. 
because uh, people don't, some people don't have a choice about where they can fill their prescriptions. And I thought that retail was more about the freedom of choice and where you can get your prescription filled, or where you can buy your gas or your booze or, or something like that. And, and that's not what that's not what's happening today. That's not what healthcare is about. Now you're being directed to specific facilities. So this concept of retail, <coughs> retail community is getting blurred. It's not the same like it used to be. Uh, and when your boss makes a decision to uh, have a medication or to, to have a prescription drug benefit, that that's what it's called. CVS Health has a PBM, Prescription Benefit Management Company, and they direct their people to go to, uh, they, they can direct people to go to specific locations. So it's not, it's not like retail like, like Mr. Shepard was suggesting. It's not quite that simple anymore. Uh, and the other, the other thing that I found interesting when, uh, as they were speaking, they talked about uh, CVS specialty services. Uh, that's where you sometimes you get some really unique, highly expensive medications. We've all heard about the $84,000 medications for uh, cirrhotic livers or, um, uh, uh, sorry, hepatitis C. Uh, and not that specific drug, but there are many drugs like that, that are considered specialty drugs. Um, a lot of times you're being directed, you can only get those medications at very specific, unique locations. Now what makes them special and specific, I'm not really sure because I've seen letters that have been sent out to various CVS pharmacies and, and patients and say, you want to get your specialty medication, just go to any one of our uh, 7,800 pharmacies, you can just pick them up. There's no special counseling, uh, but once again, you're being directed. So the, the concept, what I'm going back to, is the concept that the freedom of choice, the freedom to choose where you wish to go uh, because of the service, because of the inventory, because of the personalities, because of the education, that's all changed. That's different. And that's Maybe, maybe that should be considered in your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hello. Um, I'm Jennifer Roberts. I'm an intensive care unit nurse. And I do agree with um, Mr. Katz that even in the hospitals now, physicians have to go to the pharmacist to determine, and they determine what meds will be given two patients, and I see this out in the community, physicians in the past were able to prescribe which drugs they wanted to give to a patient. They are no longer able to have full control over that. So pharmac the pharmacist does provide a service. I'd appreciate understanding. Ma'am, I'd appreciate understanding how that differs from just say my experience, as Mr. Shepard pointed out, as we <coughs> age, um, my drawer that I have medicine in is a lot bigger than it used to be when all I had was aspirin. And my experience, just so you can educate me in the last 30 or 40 or more years of, of going to doctors, is that if I have a problem, my doctor tells me that this is what I think you ought to have, then he or she gives me a prescription or calls it in, and I've been going to the same pharmacy in Newton for 30 or 40 years, and never once has there been a thought or a suggestion that my doctor calls my pharmacist and says, do you think Michael ought to have this, even though I've been seeing my pharmacist for longer than my doctor, and I've never had it questioned as to whether or not my pharmacist would want to give me that medicine. So I just, if you have a moment, I'd like to understand under what delivery system a doctor would prescribe to a patient a particular medicine and that patient would go to the drugstore and say I want this here's my prescription and have the pharmacist say I really don't think you ought to have that so I'd really it would help me to understand when that occurs just briefly well um, it, it, um, I can't say for every person but if a if a um, pharmacist felt that another medicine would be 
better for a particular situation. It would have to be individualized. They could call the physician and have a conversation about it. Well, the, the, the fact that they could, but how would a pharmacist who didn't see you, didn't treat you, doesn't have your medical records, but is simply presented with a prescription who they may not even know exactly what the theory is behind the problem you have, how would that person ever suggest, I think there's a better drug for you to use? Well, how, how would that ever happen? Well, they have to have a discussion with the, the physician. I'm just saying the, the trend of how things are going are the pharmacists do, um, they do prescribe. They prescribe in, in a hospital setting, and I can see it, the changing of health there is a change of health care, and it is not like it used to be. Um, and I agree with Dr. Katz that you go, um, that you go into um, a retail and you buy something, because you choose to buy something, but you, when, you go to a, when you go to a pharmacist, you have to have a prescription, it's a professional, and it's not that you go in there and say, okay, um, I'm going to have digoxin. You have to have a prescription for it. Isn't your choice? Well, and I, I would agree with you, and I'll, I'll close on this, but again, I, I, this, I don't think this was responsive, but, but when I go to a pharmacist, I don't say I have this problem. What drug do you think I ought to take? Um, I've already gone to a doctor that told me, and I think that I recognize that certainly in hospitals and things, there's a dramatic change in terms of how the pharmacies in the hospitals work with the doctors in the hospitals. I'm just suggesting I haven't seen that in the retail setting where when I present a prescription to my pharmacist, other than the federally required uh, question of do you need any counseling, which you have to sign every time to say yes you do, you don't, uh, I've never encountered nor has at least to my knowledge, my wife, and I can't speak to everything that my wife knows that I don't, um, nor anybody I've ever spoken to has ever presented a prescription to a pharmacist and said, I'm not sure that's the drug you ought to be taking. Uh, let's talk to your doctor and get, I'll get back to you as to whether I should fill that prescription. So I've just, I've just never heard of that. So that's really quite a, a well, dramatic statement. Um. Well, I see the movement of that when you do go mm -hmm. in, and if they, if a farm, maybe your individual case, but there's, a, there's millions of cases where you can go in and a pharmacist will not be able. Of course, this is, they may not be able to give that drug. They'll say they have to give a different drug instead of the one that you're. Oh, very often they may not be able to give a name brand drug, and they may say, "I have to give you the generic unless your doctor says you have the name brand." But we're not, we're not talking about that, are we? Right, but um, I, I just, I see the movement. I work in it. I work in the healthcare okay. system, and I see the movement. And it will be out in the periphery. And sadly, I have to deal with the healthcare system lots more than I used to, so I see so. it too. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. And, and, and with respect to my colleague, I, you know, I, I see a few other people rising. If, if it's just to address his question and he's, and he's satisfied, we don't necessarily... Yeah, I'm just trying to be educated on that specific thing that I was surprised at. That's all. Well, I, uh, again, uh, I do want to speak to that briefly as, again, practicing physician who's dis dispensed many drugs for 26 years. It's not a new thing, actually. Uh, the, the pharmacist, and this is just speaking to specifically pharmacists, licensed professionals being within a retail pharmacy. They are consultants to the physicians. We call them all the time, uh, not necessarily to say uh, so-and-so has all these symptoms, but to discuss different classes of medications. And also, the pharmacist would have access uh, to uh, the prescribing records from other physicians that the physician prescribing may not have. So it's a collaboration. It's a consultant. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Karen O'Neill, I just wanted to comment that I'm a little bit insulted by your most re your comments and questioning the role of the pharmacist. I have a son who's a senior microbiology major right now at Clemson University, also a Hopkins High School graduate, and he is in, currently enrolling in pharmacy school. 
a five-year program. He's, we're going to be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it's insulting that you can't respect the medical community and what the role is, because there's a lot of time and investment, and in, uh, it's a five-year program. So he's not going to just be, you know, filling, do, doing what you're describing. So perhaps you don't understand exactly what the role is, and that's what this case has been trying to describe. The bylaw was written by the town, and you need to abide by it. The company refers to themselves in the way that the bylaw was written. It may be an unfortunate thing, but your job is to follow the law. The law is written. The company describes itself that way. And Mr. Shepard, I don't think that you file an insurance claim for your yogurt. You file insurance claims with your medical company for your prescription because it's a medical purchase. It's not yogurt. Thank you, ma'am. Just a little bit more clarification. Um, so, uh, what just happened to be thinking of it. You talked about um, our, our role. Uh, one of the things we need to do that we, we pharmacists have to do all the time is we have to report uh, to a database in Massachusetts flu shots. Uh, that's that's common. That, that's the right. That's the regulations now. Um, and we also have to all controlled substances, all controlled substances. So when you go into a pharmacy. Uh, you don't do this at a gas station or any place else. Maybe a gas station if they're selling liquor. I, I don't drink, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, every controlled substance, whether it be Valium, whether it be Percocets, whatever, it's reported to a national database so, so that we can, and, we, and we're obligated to put that in there. And doctors, there's new regulations coming down. Doctors have to look at this, this database before they prescribe to make sure there is an abuse. It's, it, it, it really is a profession. In reference to your pharmacy, I'm sure they're wonderful people. Um, our particular pharmacy does some specialty work, and we have doctors calling us up all the time. So we have to do a lot of work with Lyme and mold and yeast disease and things like that. Uh, and doctors are calling us up all the time. What do we do? How do we get started? Who do you know that can help us help these patients? Now, I don't know if the CVS does that, because uh, I'm not part of their operation. But I'm trying to tell you the scope of what we do. And, and there's another thing that's happening, too. Uh, and this is kind of new. There's a thing called star ratings. I don't know if you know this. And this is being uh, enforced by, uh, I think, Medicare Part D. Uh, and a lot of the insurance companies are, are following this. And there's things called uh, medical adherence. Uh, and um, so, in other words, if you prescribe a medication, are you taking a medication? And if you're not taking medication and you get enough patients not taking medication, your ratings go down. Your ratings go down, they don't want to have your as a part of the network. You're out. And that's going for, uh, let's see, there's, there's, uh, there's medical ad uh, adherence. Um, then there's, um, I forget what they, they, they call it, but trying to get all your medications at the same time so that people aren't making multiple trips. I mean, we're invasive into people's lives. We can be very inconvenient to a lot of people, but we're trying to be less inconvenient. Uh, and, and that's part of what a, a, pharmacy is, a pharmacist is doing now. It's not easy. Trying to convince somebody that um, we're just trying to save you time and money and, and effort, uh, sometimes it's not easy. So I'm, I'm not sure that I, I added anything here, but hopefully I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, briefly, Emily Pilot, 67 Front Street. Um, as a prescriber myself, I work in healthcare. Um, I completely back up Dr. Anaki's and Dr. Katz's statements in that we are very, I mean, I've called pharmacists numerous times to ask them questions. We definitely, they definitely help us. <laughs> they give us support. It's, you know, very clearly stated in the health services facility wording. I agree with it as a prescriber. We got here because we felt it was our turn to step up. There have been numerous issues that have come up in our town over the years, and we've all known people that have done the right thing to step up for what they believe was right in Hopkinton. So we felt we had to finish what we started. This started way back in June <laughs> with lots of meetings. Um, we overcame numerous hurdles, reading direct attacks about us in the papers made by Crosspoint and outward criticism from our own Chamber of Commerce, being called at home by the media to ask for comments about why our butter suddenly backed out with our warning, fundraising tirelessly to pay for legal representation, and spending many late nights, weekends, and meetings researching and organizing our findings. It would have been easy to give it up, 
<laughs> all the twists and turns <laughs> that we've been dealing with over the past three and a half months, it would have been easy to throw it in. And believe me, it was tempting on numerous occasions. <laughs> but nearly every day, people asked us, how's it going? What's the latest? Thanks for all your efforts. And so we chose to stick with it because this, we care about our town and we had a tremendous outpouring of support. So we're here before you this evening to ask you to review a legitimate and compelling legal argument that our town bylaws explicitly prohibit a CVS pharmacy as being allowed in the downtown business district. Thanks. Sir? Uh, Scott Richardson again. Um, Again, I wanted to kind of just talk briefly about a uh, comment that uh, Mr. Shepard made and some of the uh, things that the Zoning Advisory Committee works on on an annual basis is to identify uh, any zoning uh, areas or uses that are not in compliance and try to promulgate some amendments so that anything that isn't in compliance with zoning might become in, com in compliance. Uh, so that, again, we would never want to uh, pass or recommend any legislation that would create a non-conforming use in a district that's already uh, allowed by right. The descriptions I've been hearing from uh, relative to hopping the drug would indicate to me that that is becoming a health service provi uh, facility. And, of course, we would never want to prohibit that in the downtown district. So, again, just to say that that zoning amendment was never intended to make things that are existing non-conforming. So. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I just make a uh, respectful <coughs> point of order? Sure. Thank you. Um, I only uh, asked to interject based on the time. And um, my client, Crosspoint, um, would just respectfully ask that to the extent that the board believes that it, it's received sufficient information, and the briefing, certainly, on these legal issues has been extensive. There's been an opportunity for people to speak. But I know that, th that there may be questions that the board could have for counsel. But um, I just want to reiterate that, I mean, this appeal was filed two and a half months ago. And it's been, frankly, hanging uh, as a cloud over uh, the right of a business owner, a property owner in this town, to lease its property. And so, again, the ZBA runs its own meetings, but I'll, I'll call it perhaps the, uh, an anti-filibuster um, preemptive request that to the extent that the board does feel that it has the information that it needs to make a, to begin its deliberations on standing and on zoning, that, um, that it consider closing the public hearing this evening. Just a, a respectful request by I, Crosspoint, and I realize that the board will obviously... And, and I recognize that your client would, would like this to be moved forward as expeditiously as possible. Um, at this point, we are uh, essentially out of time for the for the evening, um, and I know we have uh, a number of questions of council on the merits um, that we're not going to have time to get to, um, as well as getting input from town council. Um, I, I think that's going to have to defer to another meeting. We'll have to uh, consider briefly what that's going to be. But uh, before we get to that point, just so I can make sure we've we've addressed any comments from any more comments from the public. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Yeah, no, Please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Meredith Wolcott, 8 Hazel Road. Um, just, I just wanted to kind of address uh, Mr. Shepard's um, point that he made, and it actually came, uh, brought something up for me. So when I go to the drugstore, I have a flexible spending account, debit card, that's given to me through insurance that I can only use on prescriptions. I can't use this on the retail side. I cannot buy gum. It, it, literally declines so you know to say you're going in with cold hard cash is is not true because a lot of us have these accounts that are strictly for medical purposes so I just wanted to to bring that up that so. thank you ma'am <coughs> um, then uh, I don't believe anybody else from the public is standing so if no one else has anything um, then I think as we're out of time, um, what I would suggest is that we find a time to, uh, to reconvene that maybe at the next meeting, which I believe is only a week away. Um, what else do we have for that, Adina?
the daycare one that we can get in, right? And another. Folks, excuse me, if you could just keep it down for a few more moments. Wait about that comes back. From the, the uh, projection hanging around. Every time we, we can do that. That's the landscaping? Yeah. Didn't we talk about that as next week? That's the last time forever, right? Yeah, we did. Um, I, I don't think they'll take very long, and I, I would suspect even though we're going to have a fair number of questions of, of all of the council involved. I, I don't think it's going to take more than an hour. I, I think we'll be able to to accommodate. Um, uh, let me just check with council um, a week from today. Chris? It works for me. Okay. Cross points council? It does work for us, and we appreciate uh, having it. I, I can be available next week. Okay. Wonderful. And, uh, Mr. Katz, before we close. <laughs> I was just going to ask if you could put it off a week. I won't be here next week. I'm sorry? I, I'm not going to be around next week. I, I know this, is, this is, doesn't run on my schedule, but uh, if we could put it off for one more week, that would be great for me. I'd like um, to be here. I think we're not scheduled for then another two weeks after next week. Um, and at this point, we've heard from everyone in the public and we've heard from you. So I, I think you know, we have some questions on the legal issues of council and we'll confine it to that. But please speak to your council um, on those and, and make sure they're, uh, he's as well armed as possible <laughs> for our questions. Um, and with that, um, we are not closing the public hearing. We will continue the public hearing for a week from today, uh, 7.15 again, or as, uh, as it's called after the existing hearings. Mr. Chairman, yes. just to be clear for me, um, that the public hearing is not been closed yet, I will have an opportunity, apart from the questions you may have that hopefully I can answer, I would like an opportunity to respond to some of the, the arguments that were Yes, as, as we promised you at the outset, yes. There will be summary time. Yes, and that's why we, we simply can't do it tonight. Um, and Council, would you be amenable to signing the continuance as well? Then... With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Hearing, hearing a motion to adjourn in a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Huh? Here we go. We continue the hearing. Our, <coughs> I just so disagree with all that. All right. Well, let's. Um, I move to continue the hearing until the 14th. Second. All right. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. We have a signed hearing. <coughs> now I'll ask if we have a motion to adjourn. And uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.